Chapter Twelve of the Steel Hammer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Beauvais. The Steel Hammer by Louis Albach. Translated by Elizabeth Warmly Latimer. Chapter Twelve: The Two Wives. At the end of luncheon, Gaston, on rising from table without any apparent purpose, pulled out of his pocket a newspaper, which seemed to take up too much room with his cigar case, and laid it down before him still folded. Then he quietly lighted with extreme care the excellent cigar he had selected for himself, and seemed to be making ready to go out. Gabrielle would not prevent him. The newspaper, which she dared not open while he was there, fixed her attention and made her wish to be alone monsieur de monterey desired no doubt to demonstrate that he was a free man and foresaw nothing that could interfere with his liberty he said to gabrielle laughing i have a great mind to take roger with me oh yes do cried the child jumping up in his chair do take me papa roger was not spoiled by his father the intelligent little creature who for the last two days had seen a lowering black cloud over the house, was enchanted at the bright gleam of paternal friendliness, which was piercing the darkness and bringing them all back into gaiety. This proposal to take him out walking was the same thing to him as the promise and the reality of the doll had been to Florence Mortier. It is cold, continued Gaston, but the weather is beautiful for a walk. Then turning to his son, with an expression less like a father's than a grandfather's, he said, I'll take you for a beautiful walk. We will go to the Champs-Élysées. Gaston, as he said this, was himself undoing his boy's napkin. Yes, that's nice. To the Champs-Élysées. I shall see punch. We will see punch, repeated the model father. We can go and drink some milk in the Bois de Boulogne, added the child, encouraged to go further. Gabrielle, who had been listening to them, with a half-smile, giving the same loving glance to both her children, started at these words gaston sucked his cigar and said with rather a forced laugh we can go to the bois de boulogne if you like but this is not the time of year to drink milk there the boy ran and kissed his mother whose formal permission had to be first obtained but gabrielle readily gave it it only took a few minutes to make the needful changes in roger's dress that he might be fit to accompany his father and then gaston very proud of himself in his new role which was one in which he was by no means blasé went off holding his little son by the hand gabrielle had had no hesitation about letting her husband leave her paris was no longer a dangerous place for him full of her new confidence notwithstanding some obstinate resistance in her heart she would have let her gambler go back even to the card table so happy was she to feel sure that he was not guilty so glad was she to know that his worst vice was love of play as soon as she found herself alone she seized the newspaper ran to the salon flung herself into an easy chair before the fire and searched for the paragraphs she was anxious to find she had no need to search long by a happy chance the paper was folded so as to leave on the outside part of the sheet the various facts on which she wished for information monsieur Henrion had been right the paper was full of the murder all paris was talking about it it announced that thanks to the prompt measures taken by the law or rather by the police the murderer had been arrested and committed to mazas and that morning would be probably confronted with the body of his victim he was an upholsterer living in boulogne a relation of the deceased they mentioned the disappointment he had suffered relative to the inheritance which had all fallen to the man who had been murdered at his house a sum of money in banknotes had been found which had been part of the sum received by pierre and what was still greater proof they had found the hammer which had probably been used to commit the deed the paper which boasted of the most correct information added that its reporter had been allowed to see the hammer it described it it explained that it was a kind of hammer used only by upholsterers it added that it was thought probable it would correspond with the wounds in the skull as described in the report of the doctors gabrielle read this article several times over 
there was no possibility of mistake there it was in plain print nobody could have had all these details inserted only to mislead her it was the truth she was amazed that it did not make her more happy she was sure she ought to be happy what further doubt could remain it seemed as if she could not concentrate her attention on the columns of the newspaper in vain she saw in vain she weighed the words of the announcement she could not reconcile the discoveries of the police with her own impressions but after all her grounds of suspicion against her husband had been so very vague they had been so swollen by her own imagination which at all times so easily ran away with her because gaston had come home with considerable winnings and a broken cane she had concluded immediately after the visit of the agent of police that he a man in good society had hidden himself in the bois de boulogne waylaid knocked down killed and robbed a miserable drunkard it was simply absurd the agents of the police had been more reasonable from the first they had set out to look for the person most interested in the death of the man murdered the man had been discovered and arrested they said in the paper that the man suspected had made admissions very likely as they had evidence enough to bring the deed home to him he might easily have been induced to make a full confession or perhaps it would be postponed till the accumulation of evidence forced him to admit his guilt after his being confronted with the body which was announced to take place that day and which in fact had taken place before she read the paper the man's sense of guilt would no doubt betray him i will send and buy an evening paper thought madame monterey it will probably contain an account of what took place at the morgue then it will all be over i will have an explanation with gaston and find out why he gave me such a horrible fright as she thought thus gabrielle was seated before her fire mending it with the tongs and still stirring about the ashes as if looking for something when suddenly she stopped and put the tongs back in their place i believe i am crazy she said to herself they have found the hammer that did the deed there is no use in my finding the other one or even looking for it what agitated her now was that she felt the singular connection between the circumstance that the man killed had been struck on the head with a hammer and that her husband who had had a mere accidental meeting with the deceased for an hour or so had had any object in hiding his cane in the first place and looking for and recovering a hammer of the same description in the ashes but after all if the murderer were really in prison at mazas there was no reason for her to dispute the evidence all she had to fear was imaginary gabrielle tried to find out the prisoner's name but the paper did not give it her that seemed to her rather alarming how would the name have helped her it could tell her nothing more than what she knew and yet this ignorance or this reserve worried her she would have liked to read it in big letters to engrave it on her memory to write it on her heart this fatal name was necessary its absence was strange without it her security was not complete why had the police which puts everything in the papers not mentioned the man's name if it were known all of a sudden a puff of air as it were seemed to come from without and set the poor wife's former fancies in a glow she felt a fire raging in her head and in her bosom did it not often happen when a case was difficult that the police the better to get hold of the guilty party began by putting him off his guard and to this end did it not have paragraphs put into the papers saying that the author of the crime was in their hands while all the time they had no clue to him the criminal misled by these assurances often had been known to fall into the snare ha ah, my god she thought if gaston mad reckless and presumptuous believing himself safe should go and compromise himself by his assurance and so fall into the net laid for him by the police what madness it had been to let him go out that afternoon then gabrielle carried away by this fear as if mounted on a hippogriff made a journey for several hours through clouds that blinded her and took her breath away it was the strangest the most unreal expedition she fancied that gaston might be followed in the street through the champs-elysees to the bois de boulogne 
if led by the invisible lodestone which is said to lure criminals to the spot where their crime has been committed he should venture into that alley in the bois where the foul deed was done do what she would she could not free herself so atrocious a suspicion as the one she had conceived against her husband cannot enter the heart of a woman with impunity it leaves an incurable wound that even a future knowledge of his innocence does not entirely cure the possibility of being able to doubt is as painful as doubt itself gabrielle made believe that she was shocked at herself for having suspected gasto for having done despite to her own conjugal affection for having outraged a man of the education and position of monsieur de monterey but from time to time the truth broke in upon her with an awful sense of justice that it was her husband who was really to blame for her mistrust or rather that her suspicion was due to his character that of a spoiled child weak till he was forgetful of all dignity violent when roused by passion and then oblivious of all propriety gaston and his boy had not been gone an hour before gabrielle began to feel that their absence had been long and to get impatient for their return from their walk she was sorry to have sanctioned it she was sorry she had not gone with them she might have been on the lookout for danger she might have helped them to avoid it several times she was tempted to go out too to rush after them to join them to bring them back and then she grew ashamed of her anxiety she punished herself for it by keeping quiet by obliging herself to wait to bear her anguish and be still by degrees she fell into that stupor that vaguely resembles sleep and which is really the imperceptible monotonous fermentation of great mental suffering she was in this state about twilight when the manservant came in and informed her that a woman wanted to speak to her who is she and what does she want asked madame de monterey languidly she says madame does not know her she wants to see her for something very particular gabrielle much surprised rose from her easy chair and looking at the servant said is she a beggar oh no madame gabrielle felt some impatience at being thus disturbed ask her to tell you at least what she wants to see me for she did not ask for madame at first it was only when i told her that monsieur was out and would not be back before dinner that she asked if madame were in an unknown woman asking for gusto what was the meaning of that madame de monterey felt uneasy tell her to come in she said quickly she rose from her chair and while the man went to show in the woman in question gabrielle passed her hands over her hair to smooth its braids looked at herself eagerly in the glass to see what she looked like and to compose her features and readjusted the waist of her dress not out of feminine coquetry nor to produce any effect upon the visitor but from an instinct of prudence that she might not be taken off her guard and as a precaution that she might be armed with everything that tends to self-possession the idea that her husband had been asked for awakened her anxiety madame jean mortier was shown into the salon she also was well armed she was dressed carefully and correctly as we know she wished to have nothing in her appearance that would plead for pity on her first entrance nothing showed that her visit was of grave importance except her pallor emilienne was resolved to keep her face from showing suffering since she was secure in her own certainty of her husband's honor she was too fully resolved to save him too proud of their mutual affection not to be able to force her eyes into a steady gaze and her mouth to refrain from trembling but she had no power to control the blood in her veins it oppressed her on her chest and besides she herself was not aware that she was so pale the moment gabrielle saw this delicate and pretty woman very well dressed and respectable she was more than ever puzzled but she was less afraid she came forward a few steps to meet emilienne with a sort of bend that was not exactly a courtesy emilienne bowed and forced herself to smile i was told madame that you asked for monsieur de monterey said gabrielle that is true but perhaps you madame in his absence could give me the information i am in search of gabrielle made a sign of consent which meant please go on the first words seemed difficult to utter ever since early morning emilienne had been speaking and pleading without embarrassment but gabrielle's beauty and grace and above all her reserve which she mistook for a prejudice against herself frightened her 
She did not know how to begin. At last she said, without choosing her words, I am Jean Mortier's wife. This conveyed no information to Gabrielle. Emilienne had supposed that everyone in Paris must know her husband's name. Madame de Monterey, however, without knowing why, felt reassured by the name. It was probably that of one of her husband's creditors. Would she ever get to the end of them? She supposed that she was going to hear of some debt concealed from her. She would pay it, or promise to pay it, and the visit would be over. She pointed to a chair for Emilienne and sat down again. After a short silence, Madame Mortier went on. You have probably heard, Madame, of the great misfortune that happened two days ago in the Bois de Boulogne. Gabrielle had not expected this. She gave a little sound as if of a fright and turned toward her visitor with an eagerness that would have betrayed her if Emilienne had had any reason to attribute her behavior to anything but a natural repugnance to the presence of the wife of a suspected murderer. She blushed. Yes, I have, stammered Madame de Monterey, nervously clasping both arms of her chair. Emilienne went on in a sadder voice. Then you did not know that the man who was killed was named Mortier? No, replied Gabrielle, though her teeth seemed to clatter in her head. I am the wife of the man who was killed? Gabrielle said this in a hoarse voice, leaning back in her chair as she said it. No, madame, said Emilienne, finishing her sentence, of the innocent man accused of having killed his cousin. By an unconscious movement, stronger than fear, and which resembled sudden sympathy, Gabrielle leaned forward to Emilienne and drew her armchair toward her. Innocent, she said. Yes, madame, as innocent as Monsieur de Monterey. Gabrielle seemed to smile. She shook her head and responded with some boldness, moved by the frightful irony of Madame Mortier's words. And yet the morning papers were full of minute details of the murder. Minute and correct, it is true, but all they say proves nothing. Gabrielle wanted to hear everything and to discuss it, but she dared not. She felt that it would be wiser to restrain the desire to know which raged within her. I do not see, she said slowly and politely, how we can be of any service to you. Oh, mon Dieu, resumed Emilienne with her voice of gentle grief, but firm with all its gentleness. You will not, perhaps, be able to help me to make clear to others the truth that now lies hid, and I need no discovery for myself. Only it was my duty to come here as I have been to other places. If you cannot give me any information, I shall at least thank you, madame, for the kindness you have shown in answering me, and I will go my way. I am sorry Monsieur de Monterey is not at home. I can tell you almost the same things that he would tell you. I am perfectly informed about them. I heard my husband telling what he knew about it to the agent of the police. It is about his having met in a restaurant the man who was killed, is it not? Yes, madame. They told me to come here. Well, what would you like to know? It seems that Cousin Pierre very imprudently displayed, indeed emptied, his pocketbook on the table, that he showed a great roll of banknotes. That is true, replied Gabrielle, who was leaning one hand heavily upon her knee, being afraid her visitor might see it tremble. My husband told me so. It seems also that the poor man was half tipsy. There were some women there that night. Have they not been examined? asked Madame de Monterey, who was not pleased by an allusion to the women who had been present at the supper. Ah, if they could only have put them to the torture, cried Emilienne, with a flash of implacable detestation, all of a sudden darting from her black eyes. I have been to see them, she added bitterly. You? I would go to see anybody if it would do any good. To save Jean, I would walk barefoot over a furnace. At the restaurant, they gave me the address of these women. I went to see them. I questioned them. I don't know if they told me the truth. They could only tell me what I already knew. They told me Pierre displayed with ostentation the contents of his pocketbook. He paid for them. Then after that, they went away, or they say so. But is this true? And if I could find any pretext to get them arrested... I would not hesitate. Once in prison, they might be frightened into telling all, but the police decline to arrest any more people now that they have my husband of Mazas. 
Emilienne's eyes were dry, but she passed her hand over her mouth as if to wipe some moisture away. "'What led to your husband's arrest?' asked Gabrielle timidly. "'The notary, who knew about the will, they went to him first. I went there, too, yesterday. He is not a hard-hearted man. He told me all that was said in his office and overheard by his clerks and himself. My husband was in despair at getting nothing from his uncle. For you know there was a will. I know. We wished too much for that legacy. That wish brought us bad luck. We were ruined.' We thought we were on the eve of finding ourselves without bread or shelter, but it is no reason, because one has exhausted all resources, that one should commit a crime. No, murmured Gabrielle. Jean might have killed himself. Perhaps had not the recollection of his little girl and of me kept him from suicide. Yes, I have a little girl, madame. She is just three, poor little dear. Well, if jean had been tempted to commit a crime one look of hers into her father's face would have stopped him but there was no danger ah madame if you only knew what a night he spent he dared not come home he wandered about like a madman all night in the bois and that is one of the things that they say tell against him i had a terrible night too you cannot understand what it is madame to sit up all night for a husband who does not come home gabrielle here could not help moving her head gently to make Emilienne feel that she understood. Madame Mortier went on. I said to myself all that night, something dreadful has happened. My presentiment was right, but it was Jean, I thought, that it would happen to. I did not go to bed all night. I came down into the street very early in the morning. I wish I had come down earlier and had gone to find him in the bois. Who knows? Perhaps I might have met or scared away the murderer. Perhaps I might have come up just at the time he was attacking our cousin. I might have seen him. I might have hindered him. Something would have drawn me to the spot. After a while, Jean came home, tired, discouraged, but not like a guilty man. I should have seen it in his face. When one loves one's husband, one reads him like a book. You know that, don't you, madame? Yes, I know it, Gabrielle ventured to say, in a tone which to other ears might seem sincere, but which to herself had a ring of irony. If you had only seen him kiss his little daughter and kiss me, there is a witness who can testify to that. When a man has committed such a crime, don't you suppose he would be afraid to put his lips to his wife's cheek or to his child's forehead? Say, madame... Gabrielle here remembered that Gaston had not dared to kiss her lips, that he had only kissed her hands, but on the other hand, he had taken his little boy out walking. What Madame Jean Mortier was telling her made Madame de Monterey in some ways more alarmed than ever, and in others it gave her relief. Sometimes she felt as if in the presence of danger, and the next moment some of her terror seemed to have passed away. She felt an attraction, a sympathy for the young wife about her own age, who was exhibiting a courage equal to her own, who had the same feelings, and who might be equally unhappy, though on one point there was a difference in her favor. Madame Mortier confidently believed her husband innocent. Poor woman, she said to Emilienne, putting out her hand, but not daring to take that of her visitor. The upholsterer's wife either did not observe or did not comprehend this sign of friendliness, or else, out of respect, she would not accept that proof of Christian charity. She went on with a little pride in her tone. Yes, I am much to be pitied, but I should be more so if I did not know my husband was not guilty. When you suffer an injustice, you have something within yourself that prevents your being totally miserable." "'Then you have not the very smallest doubt of his innocence?' Madame de Monterey ventured to say. "'Ah, madame, can a wife doubt the husband whom she loves, and who she knows loves her?' "'Oh, that is no sure reason,' said Gabrielle softly, trying to smile. "'Among you people of the world, perhaps not, madame. Your gentlemen have almost all of them some little secret vice, which, though you do not know it, makes you fear. They lose money at cards, they go to late suppers, as your husband did that evening. But among us lesser people, strong love is the guarantee for everything. Jean is no gambler. He never goes to the café. He never told me a lie in his life. I should be unworthy of his love if I could suspect him of deceiving me. Gabrielle felt bitterly jealous of Emilienne's confidence in her husband. 
she also felt some surprise and secret terror as she wondered why jean mortier's wife so clear-headed and so capable of reasoning did not accuse men who did gamble who did frequent cafes who did tell lies to their wives of the crime of which she felt her own husband was incapable then as if madame de monterey's thoughts had revealed themselves upon her face and as if madame mortier had read them there the little woman said suddenly had it not been for the notary and the things he told of hearing they might just as well have arrested those gentlemen and have accused your husband as mine gabrielle drew herself up a movement which misled emilienne excuse me for supposing such a thing she said hastily with some confusion but indeed the sight of twenty-five thousand francs ah did the poor man have twenty-five thousand francs about him asked gabrielle yes madame deducting what he had spent it was a prize that might have tempted a fashionable gambler a waiter at the restaurant told me that the gentlemen at supper had been joking about it among themselves because one of them had lost a great deal of money that evening gabrielle had an inspiration that was my husband he had been unlucky at his club she said with a smile that passed slowly over her lips and disconcerted madame mortier i thought it had been one of the others she said they gave me his address emilienne pulled a bit of paper out of her pocket opened it and read monsieur de arbois it was to recover herself rather than to bring on any explanations that she introduced this memorandum this name into what she was saying for she was sorry to have made any allusion to m de monterey's losses at play and thus to have probably displeased the kind lady who had received her so kindly and who was giving her all her attention gabrielle too was anxious to get away from this episode why have you not been to see monsieur de arbois i did go but he had just set out on a long journey gabrielle wiped away a drop of moisture on her forehead which emilienne had not noticed and very gently but impressively said did it never occur to you that he was running away yes frankly i should have thought so perhaps if i had not found out that he had gone to inherit a fortune and besides he must have heard that my husband was arrested and after that if he was guilty he would not have gone off in such haste he would have felt himself in safety very true still all may not be ended even for him what do you mean the notary has the numbers of some of the stolen notes gabrielle thought she should certainly faint the moisture stood out over her face happily it was nearly dark the two women were talking in a room that was growing every moment darker and saw each other only by the firelight madame de monterey stooped down and made it burn up brighter when she had picked up and settled the fallen brands upon the hearth she straightened herself and felt that she had regained her courage do you think she said that those numbers alone will lead to the arrest of the guilty person unless the robber warned in time should burn the stolen money what is likely to warn him ah i don't know said emilienne you are right madame it would need some chance those men who change gold for notes don't generally take the addresses of people who come to them to change money even supposing the police had warned the money changers do you suppose they have been warned yes no doubt but unfortunately the notary had kept the numbers of only three of the notes only three gabrielle looked down at the ashes on her hearth she was saying to herself that she had burned only two thousand franc notes ah if she could only that very moment get at the numbers kept by the notary but continued madame jean mortier eagerly it will be too long a time for me to wait for a mere chance if i set my hopes upon that only they will have plenty of time to sentence my husband and to here she made a terrible gesture with her hand and shut her eyes as if she saw the vision of a scaffold gabrielle trembled she had not before thought of the guillotine and yet that must be the end of it there were two minutes silence the two women bowed their heads under a sense of the same terror gabrielle looked up first she felt anger against madame mortier who instead of bringing her certainty and reassurance on all points had only added to her troubles she became colder and less friendly as she said did they not find in your house some of the money stolen that was a mistake of the reporters replied madame mortier firmly there was nothing found in our house but money we had received and the envelope of a letter 
in which our cousin had sent us two thousand francs when did he send them to you i don't know gabrielle's mouth had an expression of incredulity she thought the answer compromised the upholsterer emilienne told of the arrival of the envelope the great joy with which it had been received the debt she had paid at once and of course she repeated her husband's account of how he had come to write his own address on an envelope belonging to the notary gabrielle gave a selfish sigh of relief the evidence seemed to her to be compromising the upholsterer more and more the police must have considered it very improbable she said in a slow voice which madame mortier felt to be very cruel that your cousin would have sent two thousand francs in that way to you in the middle of the night why should he not have given this money with his own hand to your husband at the notary's if it had not appeared improbable said emilian simply would my husband have been arrested but it is the truth and that is why i will never give up i shall never be weary then gabrielle was guilty of an imprudence she threw out a challenge to the touching trustfulness of the wife the hope that was becoming uppermost in her own heart overexcited her are you perfectly sure that he told you the truth she asked insinuatingly emilienne darted a glance at her from her dark eyes piercing and bright as the sparkle of a diamond yes she cried and it is true then taking her revenge she turned boldly on madame de monterey don't you love your husband if you did you would understand me great love sometimes inspires great illusions no madame it is false love that inspires them replied emilienne whose remark showed more fine discrimination delicacy and psychology than that of the woman of the world when one lives in falsehood one accepts what is false as an excuse but the true demand the truth and they know it when they find it since i love my husband truly he cannot make me doubt him nor would he deceive me gabrielle was more than put down in argument by this answer there was that in it which jarred upon her doubts and her anxieties she went on almost mercilessly the papers also mention that they have found a hammer yes madame my husband's hammer a steel hammer which he always carries about with him ah, it was a fatal circumstance that he had it with him that day a fatal circumstance indeed said gabrielle shaking her head what could you call it but a fatal circumstance cried emilienne an accident well do so if you please but i swear to you madame that that hammer is as pure from blood-stains as my husband that must be known by this time must it not if the hammer fits the wounds exactly well suppose it does if all appearances were against him if they were heaped up piled up to overwhelm him i tell you madame i should still know that jean was innocent there is something stronger than appearances stronger than circumstances and that is the impossibility that jean is guilty emilienne had risen and seemed to have grown taller her mouth trembled her pale cheeks were flushed with a faint color her eyes gleamed like lightning they shone in that dim room with a brightness brighter than the light of the fire she moved the heart of madame de monterey which was very easily stirred but she did not succeed in convincing her for gabrielle was resolved not to be convinced she had suffered too much herself not to be mistrustful of a wife's faith in her husband she admired the simple woman radiant with conjugal affection but she compared her own daily suffering love to this love triumphant and from experience and also with heroic resolution she refused to admit that love was enough to enable a woman to see into the conscience of a lover or a husband i pity you she said with a deep compassion yes but do you not believe him innocent as i do i am forced to make some account of the very grave presumptions and the proofs the money and the hammer her voice failed her as she uttered the last word she looked into the fire you will not admit then said emilienne in a plaintive voice for her energy now needed a moment's respite you will not admit that our unfortunate cousin may have regretted his want of kindness and have taken pity upon us it is possible and it is also possible that your husband may have used the envelope to turn aside suspicion emilienne grew agitated and clasped her hands is it not possible too she cried impetuously without changing her form of interrogation that there may have been other hammers of the same shape as my husband's hammer 
of course just as it is possible and it also seems probable that your husband may have made use of his and it is possible said madame mortier that there may have been other men wandering by night in the bois yes and your husband was wandering there all night ah madame cried emilienne deeply wounded by her words why should you want to persuade me that my husband is guilty gabrielle did not falter you see that you yourself are beginning to admit a doubt she said in the same tone i suffer but i do not doubt it is not willingly that i have made you suffer why was there a tremolo in gabrielle's voice as she excused herself in these words you only add another pain to those that are mine already replied emilienne and suddenly her voice trembled as if keeping back her tears it would not have astonished me to hear such language from monsieur de monterey men may think hard things and be the dupes of appearances but a woman a wife a mother i should think might understand her dignity which increased as she said these words somewhat subdued gabrielle she too felt her eyes filling with tears it was no longer dangerous for her to give way to her feelings jean mortier was so manifestly the murderer if his wife by a touching mistake persisted in thinking him innocent it was surely for madame de monterey to sympathize with her and with this pity for the faith of a love great as her own though very different in its character there was mingled an involuntary sense of gratitude to the wife of the murderer to her gabrielle would owe all the peace of her future life she might very well in return give her such consolation as she was able she took emilienne's hands and drew her toward her do not let us discuss it she said softly i will help you to find him who is guilty to save your husband but i want to save his honor too madame in saving his life you may save everything you make me that offer of help out of mere charity not because you believe in his innocence i make you the offer from the bottom of my heart emilienne struggled against her sense of gratitude how can you expect me to accept it if in your inmost heart you think my husband is a murderer gabrielle persisted both in her sympathy for the wife and her conviction with regard to the husband i do not judge monsieur mortier she said but if it were my duty to judge him i should say to myself that you love him that you are a brave good woman full of honorable feeling and of courage and besides a tender mother i should think of you and of your little girl and without excusing the man who may be guilty i should deeply pity him i should persuade myself that love for you and his sudden stroke of misfortune had made him crazy emilienne drew away from her and wiped her eyes no madame no you cannot help me i thank you for your compassion for myself but if i prove my husband's innocence i shall not need it ah then you might well envy me but i will not permit a rich woman like you out of mere compassion for an unhappy wife and mother to take under her protection a man she can think capable of so great a crime you are very wrong murmured gabrielle but think of it resumed emilienne growing fierce with rising anger if they say truth jean must have basely followed his cousin have waylaid him in the wood and struck him dead he must have bent over his warm and bleeding corpse felt in his pockets robbed him don't you see the scene before you madame that horrible scene just imagine your own husband an actor in it gabrielle saw the scene as emilienne described it the horrible vision danced before her eyes the muscles of her face began to twitch it seemed to her that she saw gaston drunk crazy striking at arm's length a man whose face she had never seen but who now appeared to her in a mask of blood she stretched out her closed hands which emilienne had rejected a few minutes before oh hush oh hush she cried if i could suppose that my husband had acted thus resumed emilienne i should feel myself his accomplice because i had not done all i could to stimulate his conscience but i need not prove he is no murderer because i know that i never could have killed first prove to me that he never has loved me and does not love his daughter ah that would be to slander love and motherhood since then the wife and child would not have had power to hold back his hand from murder would not have put into his heart a horror of crime if not the fear of god no madame if you do not believe in his innocence when you see me believe in it 
You cannot and you ought not to try to help me. You are very obstinate, said Gabrielle with pleading gentleness. Forgive me, madame, but it seems to me only natural that I should refuse protection, which irritates my very soul. If I could have convinced you, I should not decline, for you are kind-hearted, madame. You are a mother as I am, and I feel something within me that draws me toward you. You, too, no doubt, have to bear your troubles and your sorrows. I see that you can shed tears. Yes, exclaimed Gabrielle, carried away by her generosity. Yes, I know what it is to weep. Oh, I beseech you, let me join with you. I have no tears. I will not shed any, said Emilienne quickly. It was politeness made me forget my resolution. Thank you for your kindness. I do not wish to presume on it. The papers will tell you if I succeed. But in refusing the offers you have made me, I do not give up the hope of saving my husband. You do not know as yet, and I am but beginning to learn what human justice is. It is no use to try and move the judges to the end that they may set my husband free. It is not that I want. I want proofs, proofs of Jean's innocence. When I remember that there lives a fiend, a wretch, who robbed the man he killed, who knows from the papers that Jean has been arrested, that a hammer has been seized in our house, and who at this moment is rubbing his hands with glee after having hidden or flung into the river a hammer like that of my husband? Oh, God, my God, help me to find this murderer. It seems to me that, if I could only look upon his face, I should know him. Gabrielle turned toward the parlor door. She fancied she heard footsteps, as if Gaston and her boy were coming home. She did not want Madame Mortier to meet Monsieur de Monterey. Her fears would keep coming back, in spite of her firm belief in the guilt of Jean Mortier. She could not find even a few commonplace words to say. Emilienne took this silence for assent. You see, she said with resignation, that even if I were so weak as to yield to the kindness expressed by you in words, if we found no new clue, if we did not succeed in discovering the true culprit and in bringing him to justice, we should simply have mingled our tears. I will not trouble you any further, since all you can do for me is to pity me, madame. Adieu. She made a courtesy and drew toward the door. Gabrielle detained her by a gesture. At least, let us share the means you hold in reserve to save your husband, she said. I promise you to talk it over with Monsieur de Monterey, and if he tells me anything that could be useful to you, I will send it to you at once. You need not come back, but leave me your address. Ah, uh, and I would also like to know the numbers of the banknotes that were written down by the notary. Gabrielle concealed her anxiety in asking this. Madame Mortier seemed surprised at her wanting them. What's the use? she said. Why, I often have bank notes. From your husband? Yes, I know Monsieur de Monterey must handle a good many at his club. Ah, oh, those gamblers! Gabrielle shivered, but she concealed her emotion. And I have friends who are bankers, she hastened to say. Emilien pulled out of her bosom a little bit of paper and held it out to Gabrielle. You can't see anything by this light, she said. It was indeed too dark. Madame de Monterey might have lighted a wax candle, but she either did not think of it or did not wish to let light into the room. Oh, I can see well enough, she replied. She stooped down, knelt upon one knee before the fire, and on the other, by the firelight, wrote down in her little memorandum book, which already contained the numbers of the notes destroyed, the numbers given her by Emilienne, and also the latter's address. She had shown a vivacity and eagerness in writing this, which, under other circumstances, might have passed for gaiety. Thank you, she said to the poor wife, returning her her paper. If I learn anything, I know now where to find you. Ah, try and learn something soon, sighed Emilienne. Meantime, resumed Madame de Monterey, you cannot prevent my praying for you with all my heart. Ah, that I shall be glad of, said the upholsterer's wife meekly. Though I have no need, she added, recovering herself, to be told to take my trials myself to God. Gabrielle was sorely tempted to say, While I pray for you, will you pray for me? But she was afraid to make this request, as if it might seem like hypocrisy, to ask Emilienne's prayers, to hope that the poor woman might bring her good fortune, was assuredly not uniting with her in what was for her own good. 
it was asking a sacrifice the hopes of the one seemed horribly dependent on the fears of the other madame mortier retired as the salon had grown dark especially in the farther parts of it where the reflection of the fire not very bright did not extend madame de monterey in order to prevent emilienne from knocking herself against the furniture took her hand and led her toward the door emilienne allowed her to retain it she could not well resist this passing union never guessing that it was a sign and a symbol the antechamber had been lighted up the two women there looked at each other each wishing to preserve the external expression of feeling that had been mingled outraged understood and misunderstood during their interview they bowed to each other and exchanged sad smiles the smile of gabrielle was a promise the smile of emilienne asked pardon for refusing the other's kindness and was a sign of gratitude for the reception accorded her by madame de monterey end of chapter twelve recording by diana bove chapter thirteen of the steel hammer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by diana bove the steel hammer by louis albach translated by elizabeth warmly latimer chapter thirteen an illumination when gabrielle went back into her salon she rushed to the chimney-piece and lighted all the wax candles she wanted to have a good light to make sure of the numbers given her by madame mortier and to compare them with the numbers of the burn notes that she had written down herself the examination was a brief one it established gaston's innocence neither of the notes returned by monsieur Henriot bore numbers that would implicate him gabrielle gave a sigh of triumph as if she had expected this result it was true that monsieur Henrion had only returned her two notes for a thousand francs together with some smaller ones it was true that monsieur henri de arbois had gone off with fifteen more notes which might include those that bore the fatal numbers it was true that the upholsterer's wife had mentioned twenty-five thousand francs and that gabrielle did not exactly remember what sum her husband professed to have won at cards alas if by chance he owned to having won twenty-five thousand francs madame de monterey's anguish instead of passing off would only begin over again but no here on this very spot before that fire from that very chair had not gabrielle seen a woman more menaced by a chain of real circumstances that was tightening round her than she need be by vague appearances by moral impossibilities which she could not reconcile together in her own mind had she not just listened to the unhappy wife of the upholsterer defending her husband and afraid she might defend him to his hurt had they not found a hammer belonging to jean mortier which corresponded to the marks on the head of the murdered man could the upholsterer satisfactorily explain the circumstance of his having spent the night in the bois de boulogne and finally was he not in the hands of the law which rarely let its prey escape and which besides acts deliberately never arresting people unless appearances are greatly against them and in consequence is very rarely mistaken gabrielle was an optimist she believed in human justice emilienne did not is not faith often the result of a strong desire to believe but if madame mortier did not believe in lawyers she did believe feverishly obstinately frankly and sublimely in the innocence of her husband this ineradicable belief seemed an untoward circumstance to gabrielle even now that every other danger appeared to have passed away why might she not suppose that madame mortier was trying to deceive her why not gabrielle grew excited at this thought she lit up all the candles in the candelabras with their prisms she wanted all possible light leaning her elbow on the fireplace and looking at herself steadily in the glass under the light of the wax candles and in the light of her own eyes she studied her own face and then said to herself have not i been trying to deceive her am i not anxious to lead every one astray did i not make that unhappy woman my dupe does not the power of self-sacrifice that gives me courage to smile enable me to comprehend the duplicity of this wife and mother 
who is as jealous as i am of her honor and good name and suppose i had proofs against gaston instead of accumulating as i am now doing proofs of his innocence could i not be capable of dissimulation so that no one might suspect my fears do not wives even the best of us have the most marvellous power of deception where our love is concerned and surely god is not angry with us for hiding our tears under a mask which stifles our cries as we endure martyrdom a woman cannot be a mother and a wife and tell the whole truth to a sick child or to a husband who has to be brought back to goodness i ought to laugh when i want to cry and then i do laugh i try to look handsome i try to look happy and who would not be deceived by my looks that poor woman just now was deceived by them why may she not also have been deceiving me as she said this with her beautiful face almost transfigured but with a pang in her heart gabrielle was smiling to herself before the glass taking pleasure in the pastime endeavoring to persuade herself that she had hit upon the truth at last for she well knew that the moment she stopped coquetting with her conscience she would fall down sobbing on her knees the sound of voices in the anteroom interrupted this survey of herself gaston and his boy were coming home from their walk they came back very merry they were singing that was another strange thing doubly strange for monsieur de monterey never had a habit of singing and the little boy was unusually silent for his age under the influence of the sadness of his home was it possible that gaston past master in the art of lying was doing exactly what his wife had done endeavoring to demonstrate both to her and to himself to what degree of perfection he could carry the art of deception ah i will soon know if this is real thought gabrielle and suddenly she remembered the words of madame jean mortier and fancied that lies were as perceptible as truths to true conjugal affection in the disorder of her spirit drawn always at once she mixed together the most contradictory theories she took up the very one she had just been convincing herself was false and after having demonstrated satisfactorily to herself what powers the determination to be false puts into the hands of those led into deception through self-devotion or through fear she was ready to imagine in an instant that at the first glance she would be able to see under the mask if her husband were deceiving her she went forward to meet them as they came in from their walk they came in keeping step in a sort of march like two little playfellows at play their walk seemed to have intoxicated them roger was a beautiful boy he had his mother's blue eyes dreamy and soft a well-shaped mouth already thoughtful taking its expression from the faces round him from his father he had his beautiful white skin and polished forehead gabrielle was sometimes disquieted lest this should be a sign of physical or moral weakness but roger's health was excellent only he grew taller rather than stout in his somewhat melancholy home like flowers growing in the shade he grew up toward the sun which did not often reach him of itself it would have been sacrilege to accuse him of deception he had the innocence that children have whose mothers rarely leave them but his intelligence made him conscious of a mysterious want of harmony between the two who both kissed him the one to comfort herself the other when in need of self-restraint and tender to his mother but fond of his father at the same time he became a close observer and serious by instinct his little laughs were sometimes only an effort to hide his childish embarrassment when he did not know why he pitied his little mamma or what he could blame his papa for that evening he was wildly gay he broke step ran to his mother jumping round her as he kissed her and bringing her a big bouquet of violets he was not false dear little fellow he was bringing home the gaiety to which his father had been treating him as they took their walk as well as to milk in the bois de boulogne and waffles in the champs elysees oh mamma he cried sucking in the kiss that gabrielle gave him we have had such a nice time where have you been asked madame de montre yielding to the charm of his caress to the bois de boulogne he insisted on going said gaston in the best of humors going toward his wife and holding out both his hands monsieur de monterey's face had never looked so beaming his eyes so brilliant or his mouth so serene he was frankness itself nature was revealing itself gabrielle did not ask herself whether all this excitement might not arise from a sense 
of an unexpected great deliverance rather than from innocence she was quite taken in by its evident reality she was weary of analysis she wanted to have the comfort of feeling that she had done her husband wrong like women deeply in love who after having tried to pluck up by the roots one by one all their reasons for not loving suddenly appear to give up all restraint and rush into an absorbing passion so gabrielle in presence of this man grown beautiful as he seemed to her with all the beauty of their early married life the precious grown-up baby she had promised always to protect resolved only to listen to the voice of her tenderness to devote herself more absolutely than ever to that vocation of sister mother and protectress to which she had been consecrated by her guardian gaston's father her duty was to love whatever happened before everything else always to love was a higher duty than to judge she had no need of any long arguments to be convinced of that her conversation with emilienne had charged her with a sort of electricity which was not exactly related to any question of morality to any suspicions to any past scruples but was like sparks thrown off from the love of another woman devotedly attached to her husband and influenced also by the bright springtide that roger and gaston had brought home from their walk in the bois she too wanted the voice of her youth to find utterance in song and speech that voice that so long had been hushed had been constrained she bent her forehead toward her husband for his kiss for some months past he had only kissed her hands and as gaston's lips touched her she felt neither the chill that the lips of a criminal might be supposed to communicate nor any fever of remorse it was the warm caressing touch of real affection a conjugal kiss simple and true her heart sighed away its last anxieties and covering her smile with the bunch of violets whose fragrance she inhaled with all her might she said interrupting her words by putting the flowers to her lips so you have had a charming walk yes said gaston a very pleasant one and it has given us grand appetites roger has it not there wasn't any good milk in the bois de boulogne broke in the child papa made me drink some beer and that has made me hungry gabrielle laughed at this argument well then she said i will hurry up dinner she rang the man-servant who came in for orders brought a lamp which he put down on a side table when he saw so many wax lights burning he was going to put some of them out thinking them unnecessary no leave them you will make a smell said gabrielle gaily and when the servant had gone out she said we will have a grand illumination this evening what for asked monsieur de monterey hesitatingly as he stretched himself at ease in his armchair gabrielle thought that question put the finishing touch to her conviction you seem as if you were returning from a fete she said you are all lighted up yourselves i who was left at home alone am going to have my turn yes yes cried roger whose plumed hat and velvet wrapping his mother was taking off as she spoke let's light them all up and make fireworks you should have come with us said gaston languidly yawning either from hunger or a well-satisfied weariness you never asked me to come with you and besides added gabrielle not willing to be too gay i should have missed a visit which affected me very much and which may give me the opportunity of doing a good action the visit of some charitable lady no then who was it gabrielle was surprised at herself for not having introduced the subject of the visit of madame mortier but it was the last dark shade that was likely to flicker over her new-found happiness so she thought she had better bravely make an end of it it was something more she said about that horrible affair in the bois de boulogne gaston did not start he yawned again carelessly the second yawn was longer than the first ah it was the wife of the poor man they have arrested she is quite a nice person she touched me very much he has confessed said gaston suddenly interrupting her how do you know it the evening papers tell how he has been confronted with the body see for yourself he pulled a paper out of his pocket gabrielle took it but did not open it she put it down upon the table poor woman she said with a sigh how i pity her yes said gaston who had got over his yawns and now sat up in his armchair the scene they say was very dramatic there is no room for any further doubt the little hammer they found when they made their search is the thing he used in doing it 
what kind of hammer asked roger who was listening to their talk but could not understand neither monsieur nor madame de monterey made him any answer roger who probably had a fancy for little hammers persisted what hammer what hammer an upholsterer's hammer said gaston rather impatiently roger did not seem to understand any better than before but his curiosity was sharpened what is an upholsterer's hammer like gaston saw no need of entering into an explanation roger pulled his mother's gown and repeated the question my darling answered gabrielle kindly but frowning a little as she spoke it is a very little hammer like the handle you know of your papa's cane this time roger quite understood why did his face grow red he asked no more questions but going up to the fireplace stood looking down upon the glowing coals as red as his face when gabrielle answered her boy's question she had involuntarily cast a side glance at her husband but gaston just at that moment was setting his hair in order it had been slightly disarranged and his wife could not satisfactorily observe the effect produced by this allusion to the cane he had destroyed and the handle he had raked out of the ashes what did that woman want of you asked monsieur de monterey after an interval of silence she hardly knew exactly she is like some restless soul disquieted by a terrible anxiety she is making inquiries she believes in her husband's innocence that's only her duty said gaston de monterey in a low voice and with a touch of bitterness and solemnity oh it is more than duty it is because her love is so strong for him they seem to love each other passionately and that explains the crime as well as the belief of the poor woman you say he has confessed it yes you can read all the details well i don't know if even his confession would convince her she is sublime in her persistence would you believe it she has been to see those women who supped that night in the same place you did and as they gave her your address at the restaurant well that would be enough to cure me of ever going to suppers and frequenting restaurants if i had not turned over a new leaf already and grown good interrupted gaston getting up and walking about the salon what isn't one exposed to i'm tired of it you told her of course that i knew nothing she won't come back here will she she won't come back but if i found out anything that might be useful to her i was to go and see her i have her address i don't want it i told her all that i had heard you tell the police agent it wasn't much she had been too to see her friend monsieur de arbois he couldn't have told her any more than i could she gave me the numbers of the banknotes that had been stolen gaston tired of standing now dropped again into his easy chair what do you want with those numbers he asked again yawning i will use them to compare with every banknote that passes through my hands there were three numbers written down no more that may be enough let me look at them i have them here oh i'm in no hurry replied gaston laughing i haven't got any thousand franc notes in my pocket nor even in my drawers as i have given up cards i shall not be likely to bring home any from the club it is for you to look after that since monsieur henrion always pays your money into your own hands it was a mere foolish precaution useless in fact which made me ask you for those numbers in case there should ever again come a day in which i should not be absolutely cleaned out the tone of these last words and the final slang spoiled somewhat the assurances they were meant to renew to gabrielle it was not wise to let madame de monterey remember too often that her husband had been a gambler and might be one again that slang of the club that word cleaned out de cove was one of the remaining taints of the vice that she hoped entirely to sweep away but after all gabrielle retained one satisfactory assurance from her husband's flow of words he had no more banknotes in his possession had he destroyed those that had been in his hands or had he had none but those he paid away she had little time to think about that question dinner was on the table gaston's gaiety continued and increased at table his gaiety explained his appetite his appetite increased his thirst he kept on drinking healths to his wife and son at dessert he called for champagne insisted on gabrielle's filling her glass which she would not empty 
let roger wet his lips in the froth did all sorts of absurd things made believe he was at supper declaring he would like to sup that way every night of his life talking all sorts of nonsense about the journey they were going to make declaring he had a particular fancy for traveling and cared for nothing so much as going to distant countries and finally regretted that he had not gone to india with his friend monsieur de Arbois. gabrielle listened to him quietly she was grave but hid her gravity by an indulgent smile when he rose from the table he had some difficulty in steadying himself it was evident he had lost the power to walk straight you have made me tipsy positively tipsy he said to his wife snapping his fingers as if she had been pressing him to drink wine she took his arm with a sort of maternal authority to lead him back to the salon astonished but not greatly scandalized by the readiness with which this man notorious for fast living had been overcome by his own gaiety and a glass or two of champagne roger no longer hungry was almost asleep gabrielle remained alone with her husband tete -tete, or rather she was all alone by herself for monsieur de monterey soon went into a doze in his easy chair she was not offended at this mode of proceeding she was ready to pardon this neophyte of the fireside and home and though his first entrance on his new vocation had been consecrated by wine she forgave his little lapse from strict sobriety she was better pleased to see him asleep than to know he was at the card table she said to herself that she would get accustomed to sit by him while he slept reading to herself or sewing in the end maybe he would learn to keep awake would talk to her and perhaps get interested in literature it was a great gain to have reconquered him even at the price of a little excess as she picked up her sewing on a side table she put her hand on the paper that her husband had brought home and which she had not yet read she picked it up and not willing to seem anxious having persuaded herself that she had nothing more to fear but she looked it all through and ended at last by the supplement in which was a column headed the crime in the bois de boulogne this morning said the paper the man accused who is probably the murderer was confronted at the morgue with the body of his victim the scene was very dramatic and we may assure our readers without going too far that it seemed to convince monsieur the imperial procureur as well as the magistrates and the commissary who were present as soon as the prisoner whose real name we are the first to announce and who is known as jean mortier was placed in presence of the body he was seized with violent trembling and half closing his eyes and looking down he refused for some minutes to look again at the livid corpse the face of which wore an expression of stolid astonishment and on its temples has a hideous wound however on the magistrate's order for the third time jean mortier submitted to the required confrontation his look became fixed his eyes staring horror made his face as white as that of his victim when they tried to force him up to the body he resisted at first and it was thought that among the confused words he stammered were pity pity pardon pardon however when they asked him if he confessed to having murdered his cousin he tried to gather himself up to recover his self-possession and through his closed teeth uttered a few excited denials but these were evidently the almost unconscious protestation of an unfortunate man who most probably has committed his crime under a sudden impulse and who did not till that moment perceive the enormity of his guilt when the steel hammer which we have described was fitted to the wounds on the head of the deceased the accused recovered a brief energy which seemed a supreme effort of his will he watched all the experiments attentively and listened to the explanations of the surgeon the body of the murdered man has three wounds in the skull two though very deep may only have stunned the victim or have produced a slight congestion of the brain but the third wound on the temple must have killed him on the spot the skull is completely fractured and the brain has oozed out at this point in the narrative madame de monterey let fall the paper she realized the horror that had come over jean mortier at the morgue she looked around her with terror as if the corpse of the murdered man might rise before her and point its finger to his gaping wounds but all she saw was gaston stretched out in his armchair with a bright color in his face his head thrown back his polished temples with the hair carefully smoothed over them sleeping peacefully and dreamlessly the sleep of the just 
then she felt ashamed of the fear that had seized her so suddenly picked up her paper and continued to read the reporter had taken pains to give all possible details he wanted to prove himself a past master in matters belonging to the morgue the hammer he said so completely fit the black marks of the bruises and so exactly entered the hole made in the temple that no one present could doubt that the police were in possession of the instrument with which the murder was committed while this examination lasted jean mortier did not utter a sound when they attempted to interrogate him he rolled his eyes as if frightened struggled made impatient gestures as if he saw an accusing spectre and fell backwards in a fainting fit from which he did not recover till he was in the carriage being carried back to prison it is said at the courthouse that there are other facts which will be presented to the jury which are inexplicable except on the supposition that the victim was waylaid and murdered and it is expected that the prisoner may be easily persuaded to abandon his line of defense we do not know whether on recovering from his fainting fit he made any direct confession but we think it very probable denial seems impossible after the scene we have described this confrontation has in it all the marks of the old ordeal when appeal was made to the judgment of god in old times it would have sufficed to condemn the prisoner but modern justice proceeds more cautiously she does not put her confidence in appearances she accepts them only as affording her a clue it is said that the preparation of the case by the juge d'instruction which has been much simplified by what has passed this morning at the morgue will be terminated almost immediately and that the chamber of the mise en accusation footnote answering to our grand jury translator end of footnote will make out its indictment in time to send jean mortier before the assizes of the department of the seine during next july jean mortier has an interesting face his broad forehead shows an intellectual development which might be said to indicate a poet but one remembers that lacenaire aspired to write poetry and that there are dreamers and enthusiasts who might become themselves victims and martyrs but who under the illusion of some fixed idea become instead tyrants and murderers it was rumored that the crime was committed to gratify the caprices of a mistress the old adage which is commonly right of find the woman seemed a sufficient explanation but it is in our power to inform our readers that the marriage is a legal one and that madame mortier is greatly esteemed in her own neighborhood our contemporary therefore was mistaken though it always professes to be better informed than others when it announced that madame jean mortier had this morning been arrested as an accomplice this fact is absolutely untrue we will keep our readers fully informed and they may judge by the exactitude and fullness of the details that we here offer them that we shall be in a position to gratify their legitimate curiosity we heard monsieur the commissaire de la prefecture of police remark that the murderer notwithstanding his delicate appearance must have been endued with more than common strength to have made such frightful wounds with so small a hammer if it had had a long handle the violence of the blow might be accounted for by the force of the swing it would then have had the nature of a sling and the slight strength of the murderer would have been doubled will jean mortier have this point in his defence gabrielle again let fall the paper these last reflections of the journalist seemed to her like nails hammered into her bosom she did not know whether jean mortier was or was not physically stronger than her husband could gaston have killed a man with an ordinary hammer might he not have needed that long handle which the pliant stick of his cane so fearfully represented and after all jean mortier had not confessed gaston had deceived her or else he had read carelessly his fainting proved nothing but his extreme sensitiveness that so-called judgment of god the old ordeal which the journalist so glibly alluded to to air his erudition was just a phrase and nothing more no the upholsterer had probably made no confession when he came to himself in the carriage he had no doubt protested earnestly against the construction that would be put upon his natural emotion gaston had been too eager to reassure her 
if he guessed her emotion or to reassure himself she looked at monsieur de monterey with a steady gaze that might have startled him in his slumbers he was asleep but not so peacefully as before for he was restless in his chair he frowned his lips moved as if he wished to speak or to utter a cry by degrees as he moved he got out of his seat and as he was almost about to slide down out of his chair a sharp pain in his knee awakened him he drew himself up recovered his balance looked round him as if frightened astonished apparently that he had not fallen down some precipice saw gabrielle looking at him smiled vaguely made believe to be dazzled by the light of the candles on the chimney-piece and said have i been asleep yes did i dream i don't know it must be the open air he went on i never go to sleep after my meals as you know it is not very polite of me is it is it late he got up looked at the clock found out that it was only nine dared not say he would go to bed so early and sitting up in his armchair which he drew nearer to his wife said let us talk a little will you i shall be very glad gaston at this moment felt the paper under his foot which had slipped down from his wife's lap in his direction he picked it up have you read it he asked yes but you made a mistake what mistake that unhappy man the upholsterer has not confessed not confessed no it only says that when he was confronted with the victim he was very much moved and fainted away well said monsieur de monterey in a lowered voice and what do you want more i don't want anything replied gabrielle seized again with a dreadful doubt why should i want him to be guilty especially now that i have seen his wife and have become interested in her i only said that his fainting proved nothing gaston rubbed his hands and cracked his joints and seemed to want to rub off his very skin well i say that it proves everything he said nervously at last and there are other things besides yes the hammer but gabrielle could not go on she was afraid and she was still more afraid when after two minutes of silence she saw that her husband was not going to ask her to finish her sentence nor did he answer it though he might guess the close the candles twinkled on the fireplace and were multiplied by two mirrors opposite each other so that there were long vistas of illumination gaston got up again steadied himself on his legs and was going to put out the glare of so much light which hurt his eyes but drawing near one of the candelabra he hesitated to blow out the candles remembering what gabrielle had said to the man-servant and turned his back to the fireplace so doing he saw the same vista of illumination at the other end of the salon stretching away into the distance he walked round the room once or twice knocking himself against the furniture and went and flung himself into an easy chair near the lamp as if he wanted to choose the light least painful to his eyes and to his feelings he thought it incumbent on him to hum a little air to prove that he was gay although he seemed greatly fatigued by his walk and by the digestion of his dinner gabrielle was seized by a sudden frenzy of despair and courage the hour seemed to her propitious to any attempt to get at the truth if it were to be had from her husband madame jean mortier's visit had roused her and had left her in a ferment of heroism the single agitation of gaston brought back her former uneasiness the account in the paper and the commentaries of the journalists since they had not set her fears at rest seemed more to alarm her than ever she must end it the truth let her but have the truth she would think what must come of it after she rose resolved went toward her husband stood behind him and putting her hand upon his shoulder said in a voice at once tender and determined listen to me gaston i have been tormented for the past three days by dreadful thoughts and i want to set them at rest you promise me to give up cards well you see i am keeping my word i am not gambling yes but i want to know what brought you to this sudden resolution gaston gave a little laugh took his wife's hand which worried him as it lay upon his shoulder and carrying it to his lips said with a child's submissiveness i suppose you don't want me to tell a fib oh no i implore you mon ami whatever you may have to tell me to confess to me tell the truth i want the truth the whole truth do you hear don't be afraid of paining me 
well the truth is i have been disgusted with cards this long time and as i am cleaned out i have nothing left to play with so you see i have no great merit it was a very simple thing and yet the last time you played you won people seldom leave off playing just as they have made an enormous gain why not yes i won but it is a chance that might never recur again and i had a big debt to pay how much did you win you know for i gave it all to you you only gave me two thousand and some odd hundred francs and before that you paid monsieur de arbois true i forgot i am so little accustomed to good luck that it confuses me well yes i won fifteen thousand francs and afterwards about twenty five hundred that was all 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 i swear i have not got a sou left were you thinking i was making up a little purse for myself at what club did you win that money this question was a home thrust and her eyes made it keener but gaston was prepared without hesitation without a movement of his face he named a club of which gabrielle had never heard but then it was not surprising that she did not know all the clubs in paris and who did you deprive of all this money she asked leaning toward him and looking at him with a smile a smile that perchance might take flight at his answer who didn't i tell you replied gaston it was baron von stoltzberg of frankfurt a most persevering fellow i really was sorry to win so much and who is this baron gabrielle had never heard of the man he had been playing with any more than she had ever heard of the club oh he's a very agreeable man said monsieur de monterey he is something of an artist though he is a banker if we were not just going away i should like to have asked him to dinner well then ask him we are not going immediately that's true but i think he is going to leave paris ah yes said gabriel sadly very sadly that is to be feared he is going away probably he is gone already the sarcastic tone which pierced through the sad accent with which she uttered these words struck gaston no he replied now i think of it i'm sure he told me he would not go before the opening of the exhibit at the salon he is a great amateur so we can ask him up to the first of may this was said with a sort of genial bonhomie gabrielle who felt oppressed gave a long sigh the information that this baron whom she did not know and whom her husband was so ready to present to her had not left paris reassured her a little however the hardest question of all was yet unasked she had to clear up something else something very important the history of the cane broken mended and burned and the disappearance of its steel handle gabrielle hesitated if gaston's answer were not free instantaneous and decisive if he hesitated or shirked the question in spite of all the other reasons she might have to put faith in him she should doubt doubt violently fearfully or rather she would not doubt she would know what implacable need for her own sake as well as for her husband's had she to know the truth did she want to look over the edge of an abyss and lose her balance yes she did any abyss was better than uncertainty with maternal familiarity with cruel caressingness she suddenly took her husband's head in her two hands and turning his face up to her as one turns the face of a child whose eyes we desire to look into and twisting his neck slightly so that he uttered a cry she looked full into monsieur de monterey's eyes with her own eyes very near him and with her warm breath on his mouth as if to insist upon an answer to her words tell me she said why when you came in the other evening you hid your cane why was it broken why did you snatch it out of my hands when i gave it back to you why did you burn it why why what a lot of whys interrupted gaston with a short laugh the unnaturalness of the laugh might have been due to the way his throat was twisted gabrielle let go his head but did not release his eyes without taking hers from his face she came half round him and leaning her elbows on his chair and bending over him she waited for his answer jealous cried monsieur de monterey laughing more freely gabrielle frowned this was not the answer she was waiting for 
was gaston conscious of the shock he was giving to his wife's feelings or was he following up a plan prepared beforehand have not i told you all already he said in an easy tone putting the color straight which had been disarranged by gabrielle no well it is rather hard to confess ah the poor woman began to tremble and yet she went on resolutely to the end is it a crime you have committed she said with the contraction of the lips meant for a smile but her eyes were restless and her eyelids worked nervously gaston started but he laughed louder than ever a crime well yes then on that famous night i was not at the club after midnight i know it was very wrong very wrong i ought not to tell you and if you get so fierce at the first word i can't go on go on she murmured drawing closer to him well then my dear little woman i went to see henri de arbois and he was visiting a woman where does she live how curious you are i want to know everything where does she live gaston without hesitation gave her an address what's her name gaston gave a name the rapidity of these answers was a masterpiece of effrontery or else it was a proof of truth carried to the limit of propriety i shall remember the name and the address said gabrielle threateningly what are you going to do about it i am going to find out if you have told me the truth i will go and see her as the wife of poor jean mortier went to see those women who supped at the same place as you gaston seemed hurt you don't encourage me much to be frank with you my dear seeing that for once i have made my confession without drawbacks or reserves ah if i were only certain it was a full confession what penance would you inflict on me none i should forgive you all the past and believe you for the future gaston reflected for a second or two and bore with courage or effrontery the searching look in his wife's eyes i have not anything very bad to confess he said with coaxing in his eyes and voice and with charming frankness of manner then why don't you let me know at once my friend henri de arbois is always laughing at me you know for being so afraid of your goodness in contrast with my own folly gabrielle here remembered that monsieur de arbois who had sometimes come to see her had jokingly spoken of the submission with which gaston in common with other husbands would say to his friends when he stayed later than usual at the club ah if my wife could see me now how she would scold me exaggerating of course her indignation but pleased to escape from her tutelage and ready to plunge into fresh follies because they had acquired the attraction boys find in playing truant with a little nod madame de monterey assented to the fact that she was greatly to be dreaded by her husband well pursued gaston the other night all the time we were at cards and at supper henri kept on saying to me you are afraid your wife will scold you that she'll put you in the corner i came very near to getting into a serious quarrel with him and then out of stupid bravado just to show i could do as i pleased when he asked me to go with him and see an actress whom he visits i agreed then that was before you went to the club where you won the money no we parted on the boulevard when we came out of the restaurant then i gambled again and won after i had the money i said to myself that i would not wait twenty-four hours before paying my debts and i went and i looked up my friend where i knew he was to be found what did you go and make a visit to any woman at three or four o'clock in the morning in the first place it wasn't more than three i recollect and then i knew that i should not break in on a tete-a-tete -tete. gabrielle's color modestly rose how did you know that i knew that henri's actress was at an actor's ball and would not be home before early morning he had asked me to come and keep him company while he was waiting and said that we would have a game of bezique i refused but when i had won and had the money in my pocket fe charlemagne as we say at the gaming table i thought it would be fine to go and tell him of my luck we fellows are all like that i knew where he would be and there i found him yawning trying experiments with the cards all by himself tempted to get the lady's maid to play with him her mistress had not come home we had time to settle up our accounts and we were playing bezique when she came back with another lady do you want her name and address too no no go on murmured gabrielle ashamed to be forced to listen to such a story 
confounded by the minuteness of the details almost convinced by their number and particularity gaston had recovered his self-assurance he saw that his wife though not yet convinced was disposed to accept all he was relating to her he went on volubly and then while henri paid court to his actress i was the object of the other lady's attentions why was she there i am sure i don't know excuse me for telling you all this but you insisted on hearing it i have not much more to tell you it was just one more piece of folly on my part added to the many i have been guilty of i had no right to leave you worrying all night alone for nothing i am sorry i did feel i ought not you will do me the justice to confess that though i may be a good-for-nothing gambler i never have given you cause to accuse me of anything else so i was ashamed of having gone there i was going away when the young woman very angry with me seized my cane which i had in my hand and told me she should keep it as a forfeit that i would not get it back again unless i came after it to her house you know i never had much patience i wanted to recover what belonged to me and i was a little too rough it seemed to me like sacrilege to leave even for a few minutes a thing you had given me in that person's hands i had a struggle with her to get the stick and in the trial of the strength the cane got broken ah i only wish i had broken it across her shoulders that's all i went off furious i did not choose to come home at once i wanted to walk off my anger i was thoroughly ashamed of myself i didn't like as soon as i came in to give you so humiliating an explanation i did not dare i hid my cane intending to have it quietly mended and nobody the wiser why did you fling it into the fire when i gave it back to you i was wrong i see it now but you see i felt as if this having it secretly mended by your orders was a reproach i could not bear i could not control my impulses of course it was ridiculous i beg your pardon my darling you must make me another present and i will take better care of it meantime don't be angry with me indeed you ought not i give you my word of honor i am so anxious never to give you any cause to be grieved with me any more that that ought to efface all my past sins for indeed i am telling you the truth look me full in the face as much as you please you will not find me afraid to meet your eyes Tien. see now if i look afraid he opened his eyes to their full extent and it was true he did not seem to have the slightest fear his mouth half open was tremulous with ardent tender feeling his eyes which two hours earlier had had the brilliancy of drunkenness had slept it off and were bright and clear again gabrielle saw in her husband all the lost beauty of the early days of their married life and the years that had preceded it that juvenile charm she had so often gazed at and admired when as a young girl she said to herself that she must love him with more than a sister's love if she were to fulfil the mission imposed on her by old monsieur de monterey her guardian if gaston were sincere in his repentance and true in his explanations was it not delightful to think that with a good conscience he had regained the early beauty of his face beauty is not unfrequently an argument for goodness gabrielle was weary of her struggle she wished so much to be convinced that she forgot all the reasons she had for not being so nor was she aware that she the more readily believed all these extraordinary explanations because they were accented underlined as it were by kisses on her hands and on her arms though not upon her mouth he did not dare she let two big tears fall they were proofs of her weakness and of her surrender and laying her head upon her husband's breast she said with angelic gentleness ah if you are deceiving me this time i shall die then gaston for the first time in his life knew what true love was he had not before understood it now he understood blasé and indolent and selfish as he was either fear or remorse softened him and he felt a new light dawn into his soul though his smiles had been false the tears he shed were true he wept because he could not help himself under the influence of those soft moist eyes in which he read forgiveness ah if for the future i ever cause you another sorrow dear he said i shall kill myself gabrielle accepted this show of feeling as a proof of truth she had had more questions to ask but she could not put another 
was she therefore a coward she was simply a wife and that evening she went to bed intoxicated by her happiness having dried with kisses the first genuine tears on her husband's part that had ever responded to her own the most consummate hypocrite may have in hours of great danger involuntary ebullitions of feeling which may really serve his cause because at least they are genuine i have always thought that tartuffe must have deceived himself and that he could never have played his role of impostor so perfectly unless he were acting under an illusion and was unconscious that he was acting End of chapter thirteen recording by diana beauvais chapter fourteen of the steel hammer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by diana beauvais the steel hammer by louis albach translated by elizabeth warmly latimer chapter fourteen the judgment of god the next morning madame de monterey wanted to analyze her impressions of the day before she thought over in her own mind all that gaston had detailed to her and recalled how each answer to her questions had been made promptly and with full assurance by her husband his tone had been even more satisfactory than his words she had kept in one corner of her memory the name and address of the woman whom gaston professed to have visited with monsieur henri de arbois when her husband had been speaking and while she was still unconvinced she had said to herself and she had said aloud to him that she would see this woman and find out the truth of his story but when in the morning she asked herself if she really should have courage to make any such inquiry at her house she found her threat had been ridiculous under what pretext could she go there to find out if her husband had been deceiving her what could she say to excuse her visit and most likely the actress would decline to see her but i might find out if there really is such a person she said making a compromise with her curiosity but how would it help her if she did find out that such a street at such a number such a lady lived gaston would probably have given the name of a real woman and a real address and this would not prove even if she found his information so far correct that he had been to her house at three o'clock in the morning besides at the bottom of her heart madame de monterey shrank from any such inquiry the day before she had said to herself that she could be as brave as the wife of jean mortier but she dared not feel sure that she had the same faith in her husband she felt a repugnance to imitating the wife of the man arrested wishing to avoid all analogy between their two households she sent out and bought a paper there was more in it about the confrontation the day before and its consequences jean mortier it said was utterly despondent and made no more protestations of his innocence there could be no doubt that he was guilty his looks as well as a few despairing words that had escaped him amounted to the same thing as a confession the probable date of the trial was also given unless on the same night in the same way two exactly similar crimes had been committed madame de monterey would be forced to believe herself the dupe of her own fears and yielding to the evidence might give up all inquiry gabrielle decided that their journey must begin immediately the very next day her proneness to suspicion had perhaps she argued been a kind of insanity by change of air she might get out of that unwholesome atmosphere cure herself of that dreadful fever and get rid of the anguish that remained even though now she was satisfied as to the truth gaston that day was gentle and conciliating just as he had been the previous evening he was equally gay at breakfast time but gabrielle contrived to keep him within bounds and not to let him drink so much as the day before when they rose from the table she said she was going out shall i go with you said her husband gallantly if i were going out to take a walk i should be very glad of your company she said laughing but i am going to make a visit that generally you do not care to make i am going to see monsieur henrion will you tell me why oh not to ask him to take measures for a legal separation though i might make out a case against you after your confession but it is on the contrary to get the means for our keeping always with each other 
what do you mean i want him to get us letters of credit for switzerland and perhaps for italy shall we start at once to-morrow if we can manage it then you think nothing need keep us in paris i think we are as free as boys are in the holidays you did not think so last night i was wrong and besides you have made me jealous i don't want you to go back and see the fair lady who broke your cane gabrielle smiled gaston gave back the smile as rippling water reflects a light upon its waves you cruel woman he answered i thought you had quite forgiven me of course i have but absolution is never given without penance what i impose is that you must submit to my little jokes monsieur de monterey was very anxious to go with his wife he assured her that he had the greatest regard for monsieur Herion and owed him several visits was he afraid that gabrielle wanted to go out alone in order to visit the actress in question he fancied a sort of threat in the gaiety of her last words gabrielle persisted in refusing her husband's arm she went straight to monsieur Herion's. her arrangements to secure money for the journey were soon made monsieur Herion greatly approved of traveling he believed in gaston's reformation he had always looked forward to it he said with old-fashioned gallantry he had always known that the good angel at his fireside would end by conquering the demon of dice and cards incidentally and because gabrielle herself led the way to the subject they talked about the affair in the bois de boulogne but of course monsieur Herion had no suspicion could have none of the all-powerful interest that madame de monterey took in the story gabrielle was charmed and reassured exceedingly by this direct involuntary testimony to the innocence of her husband when oracles are wanted they can always be found and yet before she went home prompted by a resolve to put an end forever to all anxiety and to make it impossible that doubt should ever return madame de monterey was determined to take one final step to reassure herself completely a step solemn and decisive the result of which would be something that no future excited feelings ever could gainsay she hesitated between two visits she was not thinking of going to the address of that other woman that would have been a miserable way of giving ease to her own mind degrading alike to her husband and herself though it might prove gaston innocent it would leave a stain upon his wife but since she had madame jean mortier's address why might she not under a pretext of comforting her in her grief go and judge of the effect produced upon the upholsterer's wife by that terrible scene at the morgue as related in the papers in spite of herself gabrielle was always fancying herself in presence of the frail woman with her energetic looks and eager words who had given her so perfect an example of wifely faith courageous love and true heroism this wife this mother was a rival with whom she felt that she would like to measure herself once more she did not now dread her as an enemy and she hoped with all her heart that she never might be forced to act as hers monsieur Herion lived in the rue tranchette as she left his house and was passing the madeleine madame de monterey paused carriages blocked up the street she went up the steps into the church gabrielle was naturally inclined to piety though she had not the mystical faith of madame jean mortier since her marriage her life had been divided as it were into two equal parts that is between personal efforts to control her feelings and warm impulses of trust in god in efforts to preserve her happiness and efforts to preserve her honor this morning it was the turn for the spirit of piety the madeleine is still the temple of glory and of victory it never inspires or satisfies ideas of despondency nothing in the building seems to call upon its worshippers to seek for aid or comfort everything speaks of strength to be increased and deeds of courage done the long white flight of steps that leads up to the church seems to symbolize a triumphant ascension within all speaks of earthly hope and the marble apotheosis of the great saint who had once been the sinner who loved much is not calculated to impair this human feeling the marble the gilding and the paintings give no hint of poverty but rather show forth the power of riches applied to the service of god in some old dark damp church gabrielle might perhaps have fallen back into her fears 
or if we may not call them fears at least into mistrust in spite of reason in spite of appearances but the magnificent church revived her drooping confidence the altar was dressed with flowers a rich wedding was going on the bride and bridegroom kneeling upon velvet at the feet of the glorified and repentant magdalen were awaiting the benediction about to be pronounced over the union of two fortunes and two risks for happiness the organ was swelling forth magnificently the wedding march it had been in that very church with the same pomp before the same artificial flowers before the same marble image of the repentant magdalen to the strains of the same music to the murmur of the same words in which the priest proclaimed the duties of husband and wife that gabrielle had herself been married she now watched as a spectator the ceremony she had not seen when she herself was its heroine and as she went over all its details she felt in them a strange charm when she had knelt there trembling at the sound of the same organ eight years before she had with a beating heart vowed before god that she would be a devoted wife her husband's guardian angel she renewed that vow that day as christians renew their vows of baptism she repeated to herself with a conviction which was somewhat like a self-righteous pride that she had kept her vow that she would always keep it that she was strong enough to continue what was already begun she waited until the mass was over to see the marriage procession pass out of the church to read the face of the young bride to see if she had prayed as she herself had done to exhort her by an encouraging smile to be a self-denying wife to gain from the smile of this happy new-made wife fresh strength for herself and fresh illusions the married pair were perfectly commonplace they were parisians of no high social standing gabrielle thought them noble in their confidence in the future and in their acceptance of its duties for she wanted to see in them a reflection of herself she trod on the rich red velvet carpet behind the procession and went down the marble steps as if she had been an invited guest one of the friends of these young people whose very name she did not care to know she followed the wedding party out of the church she saw it drive off and then suddenly stopping at a passing carriage she made a choice between the two visits she had had upon her mind she did not drive to the bois de boulogne but in a low sweet voice to the great amazement of her driver she said to the morgue madame de monterey now felt herself strong enough to venture for her own sake and her husband's whom she associated with herself on braving that ordeal that judgment of god which she had scorned only yesterday and yet which came back into her thoughts a piece of superstition yes she wanted to stand beside the murdered man as if before a judgment seat she would enter that horrible place about which she knew nothing but where the dead seemed to have power over the living and as she drove toward it she kept saying to herself substituting herself for gaston i shall not faint when i look upon him if i bear it without flinching it will prove that we are innocent the people who frequent the morgue and those led there by curiosity were very much astonished to see a lady elegantly dressed get out of a carriage she seemed agitated by none of the feelings of a mother a daughter a wife or a sweetheart the women who came there usually seeking husband or parent a child or a lover this lady gently politely and composedly asked the sergeant de ville who was on duty if it was through that great door she was to go in he drew back with a respect that was neither pity nor sympathy but a sort of grave astonishment when she reached the great glass partition behind which are shown those who have made shipwreck of their lives gabrielle for a moment felt a horror a great dread which prevented her from seeing anything it was an awful thing to stand before those spectral forms exposed for recognition two men lay there stretched out at full length between a woman and a child by degrees madame de monterey grew used to the sight and could let her gaze rest steadily upon it she did not think she saw the man whom she had come to find none of these four had any wounds upon the head one was an old man greatly emaciated a mere skeleton wasted by poverty they must have found him in some back street dead of hunger the other was young and his jaws seemed to have stiffened as if in death he had fiercely uttered a blasphemous word he had probably been drawn out of the seine 
these two poor creatures were the victims of that great anonymous homicide who is never brought to justice could they have already buried or carried away pierre mortier gabrielle felt an almost bitter disappointment as if the law had been unjust to her and refusing her the confrontation that she came to find she asked for the keeper of the place he referred her to the actuary who told her that the public exhibition of the victim having no longer any object since the confrontation with the prisoner had taken place pierre mortier's remains had been placed in the side room where they were waiting for the legal post-mortem examination so that i cannot see him asked madame de monterey with a little shudder it is against the rules madame but the post-mortem is not yet begun then monsieur let me go in i have no orders you understand that it is impossible i should gratify mere curiosity oh i assure you monsieur my motive is not curiosity is madame a relation has she come to claim the body no i am not any relation but i am greatly interested in the wife of the man accused of killing him i have come here in the interest of justice what harm can it do the prosecution to let me see him i could have seen him here two days ago if i had come i assure you monsieur i have very serious reasons then i am sorry madame that you did not apply to the juge d'instruction this objection made gabrielle tremble what reasons for this step could she have given to the juge d'instruction footnote the juge d'instruction is the legal officer who in france gets up the case for the prosecution translator End of footnote. would he have been satisfied with anything vague she saw that her curiosity might appear strange almost the result of a depraved taste if she did not more clearly explain herself she did as many people do when pushed too hard in argument she took refuge in the power of her own name she told the man who she was adding that of course that was no reason for admitting her but that he might well suppose that a lady in her social position would not have come there to gratify useless curiosity she was risking a good deal in saying this and she could go no further the man at the morgue had not often visitors of that description he had done his duty as a public officer as a man he might feel himself at liberty to grant something to a pretty woman for gallantry may be found in very queer places executioners have been known to make it a point of honor to treat with great politeness women of distinction on the scaffold the actuary i dare not call him a director for he directs nothing introduced gabrielle into a side room less solemn but not less horrible than the great hall and showing her a corpse stretched out upon a table no longer behind glass but face to face with her and in the same atmosphere said this is it madame and bowed madame de monterey pale but firm drew as near to the table as possible she had an intrepidity of which she never would have believed herself capable clasping her hands which hung down before her she looked steadily at the corpse naked and horrible just passing into the first stages of decomposition she seemed to say to it you shall not frighten me she looked at it with no feeling of compassion but rather with anger for three minutes there was a sort of silent challenge between this young wife who forced herself to gaze on this revolting object hideous even in life when the great veins were blue more hideous in death when the veins showed under the skin which seemed covered with a network of black snakes a coarse rough man threatening her as he lay there in his horror after a general examination gabrielle bent over his head are these the wounds made by the hammer she asked the actuary yes madame an upholsterer's hammer replied the man with another bow little did he think he was making himself the ally of gabrielle the defender of her husband madame de monterey eagerly examined the size of the wounds and in her thoughts compared them with the little hammer on the cane that had disappeared in the ashes she knew its size exactly probably it would have fitted as nearly as the upholsterer's hammer had done the fracture in the skull and the great bloody bruises which proved that he had been murdered but gabrielle when she felt herself not inclined to faint like jean mortier when no revulsion of her whole being took place when she kept her self-possession in presence of that dreadful corpse that cried for vengeance 
said to herself that now she was certain her husband was not guilty nor could he be since she his other self had not been terrified like jean mortier since nothing had made her shudder and the corpse had only roused in her the instinctive repugnance which such a sight must give to any woman yes she had gone through the ordeal she had sustained the judgment of god she believed in that old test with her whole soul she had borne it without shrinking it proved her husband innocent and all it could do now was to condemn her to deep repentance for her own base suspicions with what fervency she thanked god for having so visibly made known the truth to her alas we so easily believe in the hand of providence when all is in our favor thank you monsieur she said to the actuary she left behind an offering for those poor creatures who might come to reclaim the bodies of friends who had been driven to suicide by poverty and this gift disposed of any remaining scruples on the part of the functionary who had allowed her to have this terrible silent interview with the dead pale but perfect mistress of herself though solemnized as we must all be when we leave the presence of death she left the hall and passed out of the morgue with the dignity of a priestess once outside she lightened her bosom by a long deep sigh which floated up to heaven like an offering of thanksgiving and then she got into her carriage with singular excitement in her veins when she got home she ran and kissed her husband with a transport of renewed or possibly new love i have my money she said gaily we shall have enough for a delightful journey and let us start to-morrow end of chapter fourteen recording by diana beauvais chapter fifteen of the steel hammer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by diana beauvais the steel hammer by louis albach translated by elizabeth warmly latimer chapter fifteen the indictment drawn up the next day however a letter from the palais de justice prevented their departure monsieur de monterey was desired to present himself during the day in the office of a certain juge d'instruction though this summons had not been exactly foreseen it was so natural that gabrielle did not feel alarmed by it gaston merely seemed annoyed at the delay i have nothing to tell he cried all i can do is to repeat that i know nothing you saw him however at supper getting drunk said gabrielle true when a man is drunk he can fall into any kind of snare it was at luncheon at table that gaston spoke thus and to get over his annoyance he did the same thing he had done on the day that he took roger for a walk he drank more wine than usual exciting himself till he left the table almost tipsy but having become under the influence of liquor heroic and generous he said to gabrielle you are right i shall make a great point of his drunkenness the beast no doubt threatened his cousin perhaps the poor upholsterer asked him to lend him some money and he refused him brutally i shall tell the juge d'instruction that that is what i think ma foi he wasn't interesting enough to make much fuss about he was a great red impudent greedy selfish ugly countryman ah if you had only seen him yourself my dear gabrielle had seen him she had seen him more horrible than he had looked when gaston saw him stark swollen stretched out on a table waiting for the scalpel hideous threatening and in a state of putrefaction and she compared that dreadful vision not with her husband's delicate features but with the unknown face seen only in imagination of jean mortier the loving husband of that little woman so intelligent so full of tender pity and she felt herself sympathizing with her husband's aversion for the victim and all her pity going out toward the murderer admitting that jean mortier were really the man yes this was the result of having seen this peasant hercules of course the upholsterer had been threatened challenged and struck first that was all clear in self-defense he had struck back he had not been an intentional murderer the circumstance of the robbery did not present itself to gabrielle's imagination at the moment 
she would probably remember it later and in the casuistry of her faith she would find some way to explain the circumstance so as to find in it an extenuation instead of an aggravation of the crime tell all that to the juge d'instruction she said finding in her husband's words more things than he had ever thought of never fear said gaston with self-importance we must try to save the poor fellow ah i should be delighted to do so gaston's echo of that ah was so genuine so earnest that it penetrated into madame de monterey's soul and might have aroused her stifled doubts but that monsieur de monterey was in one of his enthusiastic moods a little overexcited perhaps and this explained his ardor yes gabrielle went on it would indeed be a good action we must save him for his own sake for he is not really a bad man and for his wife and for his little child gaston must have found his wife very persuasive there were tears in his eyes how good you are he murmured much moved you see she resumed there will be sorrow enough in that poor household to punish the crime committed without the intervention of human punishment and she added the counterpart of a late remark of gaston's ah if you had only seen his wife is she pretty asked the handsome de monterey laughing she has great courage she has resolution enough to bring the murderer to repentance if she ever comes to the belief that her husband is the murderer i pained her because i could not sufficiently believe in her husband's innocence i want to repair that wrong oh gaston let us save him but it does not depend on us dear i know it but among the witnesses who will testify and there are not many you from your position in the world will be one of the most important the notary in whose office the quarrel commenced may be able to corroborate you he may have noticed the ferocity of that wild beast of a man ah he was the one who might have been a murderer for a few thousand franc notes by degrees this good woman was working herself up to the point of excusing the murderer and almost of making out that there had been no great harm in the crime so dreadful to her was the remembrance of what she had seen of the murdered man gaston loudly professed an entire agreement with his wife and went off to wait upon the juge d'instruction at the last minute of this tete-a-tete -tete, at the very moment of his departure gabrielle indeed was a little disquieted by the self-confidence of her husband a confidence however with which she had inspired him he went off to the fight with a boastful kind of swagger as if he were going utterly to annihilate the man who had been found dead gabrielle became afraid that he might go too far that he might push his testimony in the prisoner's favor into paradox and though she experienced none of the agonies that had been now laid at rest she was anxious all the time that her husband was away he reassured her as soon as she saw him return by the triumphant gleam in his eyes and by his bearing he had found that the juge d'instruction was an old schoolfellow a man he knew also at the club a charming man who had understood him at the first word and who had been much struck by what he said of the ignoble appearance of pierre mortier the magistrate had even gone so far as to confess his own disgust at the sight of the victim he had noted down carefully all the details given him by monsieur de monterey ma foi cried gaston boyishly when he had told all about his visit to the juge d'instruction i really believe the acquittal of that good fellow is now certain ah replied madame de monterey sadly it is not sure i can only hope we may save his head this reflection made gaston turn pale maybe his vanity was hurt at the idea that he might fail to do more than save his protege from the guillotine his head his head he muttered as if frightened raising his hand to his own neck we must get him a good lawyer cried gabrielle eagerly that is no business of ours yes it is if we wish to save him we have no right to mix ourselves up too much in such an affair everybody has a right to be charitable of course but we must not compromise ourselves compromise ourselves cried gabrielle with a start i might seem to have borne false witness said gaston alarmed if i appeared to wish to save him at any price believe me we must be prudent very prudent very prudent gaston de monterey exhorting any one to prudence was something unheard of up to that day but the occasion was too serious to make it a laughing matter 
on the contrary gabrielle became somewhat thoughtful instinctively she felt that his commiseration for the prisoner was excessive and not altogether natural her husband took advantage of her silence to go to his own chamber as he went out of the salon where this conversation had taken place he knocked himself so awkwardly and so violently against the door that his wife said to herself with horror that his semi-intoxication at luncheon had been increased by the open air but from a vague odor that floated after he left the room around her and which came from gaston's breath she began to understand the situation and said to herself that her husband when he left the juge d'instruction must have gone into some cafe and added a fresh and most imprudent dose of alcohol to the wine that had already put his brain into a state of commotion she could no longer struggle against the fact that she was getting rid of one vice by letting in another i will cure him of this later sighed she when we can get away and when this affair is over why did she sigh so deeply was she so terribly afraid of this sudden propensity of gaston's a propensity to drink and to excite his brain or was it that the fatal stone of sisyphus had fallen back upon her that stone that she so dreaded that she thought she had surely pushed out of her path was she for ever to be associated by inexorable fate with this affair could she only be set free when the doom of jean mortier should be determined why then did she dread this unhappy man's condemnation as if it were a misfortune that threatened herself why was it that the less uncertainty she felt as to his guilt the more sadness seemed to settle down upon her end of chapter fifteen recording by diana beauvais chapter sixteen of the steel hammer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by diana beauvais the steel hammer by louis albach translated by elizabeth warmly latimer chapter sixteen the trial the newspapers were right the labors of the juge d'instruction were short and quickly over and the murder committed in march was to be tried in july this was astonishing celerity seldom had the law made so few delays of course the newspapers attributed this to their own influence over the magistrates without it they said without the daily pressure exercised by the public press the affair might have dragged on a long time but they had taken much pains to demonstrate that any delay would be an outrage upon public morality and would imperil the security of society and that jean mortier's silence or his melodramatic protestations of innocence were mere snares and delusions the reporters had so thoroughly got up the case the press was an auxiliary so essential to justice that any delay in the affair was a sort of insult to all concerned the chamber of monsieur saint accusation where indictments were drawn up was most careful not to place itself in opposition to public opinion represented by the opinion of the newspapers the affair of the murder in the bois de boulogne was assigned on the docket for the first fortnight in july it was also announced that the best criminal lawyer in paris had undertaken the difficult task of defending the prisoner it always seems as if by especial natural selection or inspiration counsel accept or choose the clients they are going to defend the best informed journals did not fail to state that maitre lacal the most illustrious counsel in desperate cases had come forward of his own accord to offer to jean mortier the honor of his services even the best informed journals do not always get at the exact truth the facts were these a priest from madeleine as the work of the juge d'instruction was drawing to a close went to visit madame jean mortier and informed her that a charitable person who wished to avoid all thanks by being strictly anonymous had charged him to put into the hands of the poor young wife and mother such a sum as might be necessary to secure the services of a powerful lawyer emilienne had been tempted at first to refuse this offer she shrank from charity she wanted above all things to know whose hand had been stretched out to aid her perhaps it was the very hand that had slain her cousin no i give you my word that you are wrong exclaimed the priest with the most evident sincerity 
besides as we already know emilienne was a religious woman she bowed her own will before the authority of the church after her first hesitation which was that of a sentinel upon his post she accepted and accepted eagerly help which enabled her to do her duty as wife and mother she went to see maitre lecal and asked him to undertake her husband's defence i ought to say here for the honour of the bar that when madame mortier began to speak of fees the lawyer stopped her with a very proud and noble wave of his hand first of all let us think of saving your husband he said that is my affair the other matter i leave to my secretary and you can speak to him about it the day after the verdict emilienne hoped she had infused her own faith into the great lawyer she saw him again a few days after he had minutely examined the papers in the case though he admitted that the affair was very grave he had a ray of hope and emilienne put faith in his visible self-satisfaction you see yourself do you not she said that he is innocent the lawyer answered by the exclamation parbleu she could get nothing more out of him to her it seemed a laconic synthetic but decided form of conviction could emilienne have suspected that the satisfaction she saw in her lawyer's face was the delight of an artist when he sees a difficult piece of work before him or of a surgeon called in to perform a rare operation the opportunity before him was superb the question of the prisoner's life or death was quite a secondary consideration nor did emilienne know that the first care of a lawyer is to protect himself from any chance of being deceived by his clients and that even when he believes implicitly in the innocence of the prisoner whose defence he has undertaken he had better not say so openly that he may not be embarrassed on some other occasion when his defence will have to be founded only on a supposition perhaps doubt is after all the secret of genius the acts of phocion for orators at the bar perhaps too great orators like generals fight the best fight and make the strongest disposition of their forces when they know in their secret souls that they risk a defeat a defeat which though just in itself would be unjust to their ability madame mortier got nothing but indefinite exclamations from her counsel but she was anxious at least to know if he felt certain of success at this he assumed the reserved attitude proper to men of science or of exceptional knowledge he replied that he ought to succeed but that there was always a risk counsel might not always be able to get the better of the ignorance or the prejudices of a jury at all events he felt certain he could assure her that her husband would escape the scaffold this assurance was a dreadful shock to the brave woman for an innocent man to be sent to the galleys was in her eyes not less dreadful than the guillotine then she said solemnly you are not sure of saving our good name our honor the lawyer when asked this question in a tone in which it might have been put by a cornelia made a vague uncertain gesture for he was much embarrassed how to reply then said emilienne i shall be a widow she said not a word more leaving the lawyer in doubt whether she believed her husband would commit suicide or whether in her desire to save her own honor she would give up her husband if condemned and claim a divorce legally public opinion meantime had made up its mind nobody had any doubt of jean mortier's guilt it was perfectly apparent but his wife and child and everything brought to light concerning his personal character his honorable antecedents anecdotes about which were collected by the newspapers excited general sympathy the romantic tendencies of the public always make it take an interest in a criminal men could not say he was not guilty but they hoped he would escape punishment there were no implacable demands for his conviction till that of the imperial prosecutor should be brought forth except in a few journals prints that slash at everything with a celestial sword these saw in this crime another proof of the inexorable influence exerted by liberal ideas among the masses by the utopias of progress and by demands for social reform novel writers and political economists were cited as this murderer's accomplices jean mortier belonged these writers said to that class of workmen called sublimes who think themselves above their proper place in life who are anxious to be rich to enjoy themselves and who find all means of acquisition permissible because they have no christian resignation 
against this picture of the city artisan envious jealous demoralized by detestable publications and by theatres and in this instance by the constant sight of luxuries he could never hope to enjoy these honest prints drew a companion sketch of the idyllic life of the agriculturist pierre mortier stood for abel because he sold sheep and jean mortier was cain because he inhabited the bois de boulogne monsieur de monterey was the only one of the gentlemen who had supped at the restaurant that night who was called upon to testify he was annoyed at this preference which was due probably to mere chance his habit of going to the restaurant had caused his name to be given first and there had been no time to summon monsieur henri de arbois before his sudden departure the women whom the police had interrogated had not been thought worthy to lend any aid to justice who knows what might have come of it if one of them had happened to mention that when pierre mortier was making a display of his pocket-book there sat close beside him a cleaned-out gambler who had been mocked at for his ill-luck by his companions the rapidity with which all suspicion had concentrated itself on the upholster had prevented any attention being paid to what had passed among the fashionable gamblers who had been sitting near the peasant's table what might not have come to light if any one had thought of asking at what club gaston de monterey had taken his revenge the declarations of the notary the conversation overheard in the office between the two cousins the night passed by the upholsterer away from his own home the letter he had received and the hammer that had been found together with other circumstances had made so strong a case of presumptive evidence against him that not for one moment had there been any thought of seeking elsewhere for pierre mortier's murderer gaston indeed hoped to escape the annoyance of giving testimony before the court at the trial but jean mortier's counsel having been informed of monsieur de monterey's kind feelings toward the prisoner and hoping to make good use of what he would testify concerning the drunken condition in which pierre left the restaurant had him set down among the witnesses for the defence when gaston found himself cast for this part he was rather flattered his conscience was relieved since jean mortier's counsel invoked his aid to help his client he would do all in his power by his answers to his questions to assist in procuring the acquittal of the upholsterer gaston had returned to his club his entire reformation would have set people talking but he gave up cards he only got intoxicated and it was thought quite natural that having lost all of his money he should have pride enough not to borrow from the jews nor play on credit gabrielle who had hoped for his total reformation was sorry but not in despair at the bottom of her soul perhaps she might have been tempted to attribute his too stupendous reformation to remorse her husband's bad habit seemed to her an additional proof of his innocence and besides she was resolved to fight against his new passion for drink when they were travelling when they were out of paris when the trial should be over in point of fact their journey might have been commenced but suddenly neither gabrielle nor gaston seemed to wish to be gone the summons from the juge d'instruction had smitten them both with a sort of paralysis of the will and had made them inert and inactive all their thoughts were of the drama in which by the will of the law gaston had become an actor or at least a theatrical supernumerary if gabrielle had been the person who had made use of the services of a priest from the madeleine to enable emilienne to choose and pay for the best counsel she had avoided any personal contact with the wife of jean mortier yet several times in a carriage and alone escaping secretly as it were from her own house she had been driven to boulogne and had passed slowly along the street on which the upholsterer's shop was situated looking gravely with a beating heart taking care not to be herself seen at the little windows of the rooms over the shop where she fancied she could see the shadow of a woman bending over her work the pale and resolute emilienne mortier in these strange drives gabrielle had more than once been tempted suddenly to stop her carriage to get out to go upstairs to fling herself into the arms of emilienne and to cry aloud i am come to weep with you to hope with you to suffer with you i want to share your sorrows but each time she had resisted the temptation 
she had driven on carrying away with her in her heart the remembrance of that shut-up house with anxiety and shame as if she were impelled to feel responsible for the grief within at last the day fixed for the trial arrived gabrielle by the help of monsieur henrion had obtained a ticket of admission to the platform behind the judges one of the best seats where she found herself surrounded by elegant people the chivalrous politeness of pierre Dodon, who offered to give the ladies the pleasures of seeing a man put to the torture has its imitators in our own day prisoners are of course no longer dropped upon by water drop by drop nor stretched upon the rack but after the mysterious agonies of their secret examination in prison they have torments enough to suffer in public to interest any number of sensitive women gabrielle brought more emotion with her to the court than she expected to find she came to it as she had gone to the morgue she wished to see though she did not own it to herself if the judgment of men confirmed or would set aside the judgment of god she wanted also to hear her husband give his testimony that morning she had carefully watched over him at luncheon and had kept him in tolerable sobriety he was seated among the witnesses irreproachable in dignity in dress in bearing but a little pale as a witness of his social importance might have been expected to be when called upon to testify in a criminal case when the prisoner was brought in he looked at him slowly and steadily as if he wanted to know his features thoroughly no doubt to enable himself to look at him without emotion jean was very pale but his color rose at intervals his look coincided in the minds of the spectators with the idea that the public had already conceived of him he was not a confirmed scoundrel he was not a depraved murderer he was what was called an alumen an enthusiast capable of anything murder itself in the paroxysm of some frenzy of desire or excitement he trembled not with fear but from grief and humiliation he looked all round the assembly and had a sudden gleam of joy upon his face and a quick smile when he perceived emilienne she had left her little florence with the butcher's wife and had come into court to sustain her husband by her love love gleamed in her eyes it might give him courage being innocent to defy the blind cruelty of human justice to carry out its error to the bitter end she was the first person who had come into the hall and she was sitting in the front row her arms were crossed upon the balustrade that divided the public from the seats reserved for witnesses she was motionless attentive with her whole soul concentrated in her eyes those eyes wandered slowly from the prisoner's bench to the seat of the imperial prosecutor as if in spite of everything she wanted to establish a subtle thread of sympathy a current of generous feeling between those two men one of whom was about to demand the life of the other in her glance all round the courtroom emilienne passed in review the judges first and then behind the judges the people of fashion who had obtained the privilege of tickets to what was expected to be a particularly moving spectacle a flash of anger and contempt came over her brilliant eyes quick covered by her drooping eyelids when she thought how sentence of death would be the most pathetic ending to the drama and possibly also more secretly satisfactory to all these curious men and women than a mere commonplace acquittal she did not look much at the jurors they could tell her nothing and somehow she feared them less than the spectators the prosecutor or the judge she recognized madame de monterey and her look faltered she remembered her own visit to the little hotel in the rue d'anjou and the lady's incredulity and yet her kindness the sorrows of her life which she had guessed at and which seemed to draw them nearer together and she asked herself ought she to love or to hate this woman the wife of a witness who was benevolent from necessity why had that grand lady come there had she come like all the rest to satisfy her curiosity to brave emilienne to defy her to prove the innocence of her husband she did not look cruel john mortier's wife saw her better now than she had done in the darkened room where they had talked together in the twilight gabrielle who had raised her eyes to the ceiling either with an instinct of looking up to heaven or else to see the architecture gave a sigh as she looked down again that sigh emilienne noticed and pondered upon why should madame de monterey sigh was it a sigh of pity for the prisoner seated upon the bench of infamy 
was it compassion for his wife and child or was it merely because she was tired and impatient for the trial to begin but no gabrielle's eye caught that of emilienne and across that distance of actual space which seemed like a type of the real distance in their destiny there was a recognition an exchange of sympathy an embrace between two souls the two women were both moved by it and at the same instant passed their hands over their eyes to hide an emotion that had surprised them both and humiliated their heroic souls they felt themselves sisters sisters in sorrow and sisters in courage all this passed during the few minutes in which every one was settling into place before the announcement of the bailiff the court is now in session and the first words of the judge the clerk read the indictment jean mortier listened to it with apparent indifference but in his heart with melancholy disdain he would not allow himself to make any protest thus early in the case he reserved his strength to answer the judge's questions and to cross-examine the witnesses till then he was resolved to bow his head under the solemn slander droned out by the clerk he bowed to it as men bow to an adversary in the arena he meant to fight against it with all his strength the reading of the indictment having come to an end they proceeded to call over the names of the witnesses who then retired and the examinations began what is the use of giving all the details of the trial our readers know it all beforehand jean related what we already know protested his innocence was careful to speak without violence and with a simple skill showed as he spoke that he was by nature gentle and incapable of an act of brutality such as the one of which he was accused he appealed to his honorable life to his wife and to his child and by a movement which was very eloquent stretching out his arms before him he swore solemnly that those hands had never touched his hammer but for work and never to commit a crime then the witnesses one by one came in maitre Bosselot, the notary was the first and also the most dangerous he however testified that jean mortier had inspired him with much interest that he had joined him in trying to obtain from the sole legatee some sign of generosity but he was forced to admit that the despair of the upholsterer had been so great that he had not been able to help fearing some disaster the judge asked him to say more particularly what he had feared he answered suicide this supposition was less in jean mortier's favor than it seemed at first sight if the unhappy man had been seen in the first transports of grief and frenzy in such a state that thoughts of his family were not sufficient to bind him to existence to keep him steadily in the beaten track of labor and resignation was it not probable that he might have conceived the idea of killing his cousin as easily as that of killing himself the difference between these two murders was not so great as to arrest and bring back to reason a man who had forgotten his ties of father and husband and what was due to himself jean mortier being asked to explain this part of the deposition of the notary did not hesitate to admit that he was in a state of mind at first in which he might very well have struck his cousin and that all through that dreadful night he had wished himself dead the notary further deposed that the envelope exhibited among what were called le pays assis de conviction seemed to him as if it were an envelope taken from his desk his chief clerk whom they were about to examine would relate he said that jean had undoubtedly offered his address to pierre and had written it on some kind of paper but the identity of the envelope would prove little it was certain that pierre if he had it had carried it away with him and whoever robbed him after the murder must have found it in his pocket with the bank notes in short the notary while trying to be impartial made the audience at the very outset see how very probable was the crime jean must have exhausted all his powers of supplication upon pierre and then maddened and exasperated must have struck him without having premeditated the blow maitre Bosselot, who had a wise head on his shoulders and a good many books of philosophy in his library wound up his testimony with a sort of postscript which very much impressed the jury he made the supposition that jean having committed the murder had taken out of his cousin's pocket-book 
only the two thousand francs absolutely necessary for the urgent needs of his family that having had a conscience that had been scrupulous up to that moment he had constrained by remorse been influenced by a strange train of reasoning that he had considered his robbery in the light of a restitution he might have considered himself less criminal because all the profit he derived from it was relief that was indispensable to his family he had been satisfied with that small part of the inheritance which he had asked from his cousin in charity and which pierre mortier in his avarice had refused this explanation the notary said had struck him and he doubted not it would strike the gentlemen of the jury is not the unhappy wretch acquitted who steals a loaf of bread from before a baker's stall for his wife and children undoubtedly in this particular case blood had been shed but surely they would take into consideration the despair of this unhappy man placed suddenly between the desire to possess money of which he ought lawfully to have received his share and the ruin of his family maitre Bosselot thought it his duty here to mention to the court and to the jury what had been the intentions of monsieur mortier faudard the uncle who had left the will a few days before his death he had intended to give a favorable answer to the entreaty of the upholsterer jean must have suffered all the more because he had been made aware of his uncle's intention of assisting him was it not natural that a man so tender toward his wife and child might have been impelled into that insanity in which murder had often been committed by his cruel mockery of his expectations this way of extenuating the crime admitted it the more excusable it was shown to be the more certain it became the way in which this view of maitre Bosselot seemed to be accepted by those present roused jean mortier as soon as he was permitted to make answer to the deposition he protested eagerly against this view of the case i suffered greatly he said with tears in his voice when i found i was not mentioned in my uncle's will i suffered also from what i considered the hard-heartedness of my cousin ah uh, if i could only have guessed he would have repented of it but i suffer now three times as much from the reasons monsieur le notaire has brought forward to excuse me no i will have none of these extenuating circumstances i am not half innocent and half guilty no if i had been capable of killing a man to rob him i should have taken all he had i would not have shed blood for two thousand francs only monsieur le notier is right only on one point no trace of more than two thousand francs have been found in my house nor will more ever be found there and if you bring about my death my wife and child will have no treasure that they can dig up and appropriate hereafter ah i hope that the wretch who ought to be where i stand now will some day be discovered there are some numbers of the banknotes still preserved i pray heaven that they may suffice for his conviction ah gentlemen do not let the discovery come too late he stopped for his emotion choked him monsieur de monterey who was waiting his turn to be summoned was in the witness's waiting-room and so did not hear this expression of a passionate wish that the unknown murderer might be discovered but gabrielle was there she shuddered at the words of jean mortier those numbers of the bank-notes were in her possession she had them in her pocket at that very moment was it possible that some day some other clue might come to light besides those that had placed jean mortier on the bench of infamy why did she shiver was she astonished that jean mortier would not confess had she fancied that he had confessed already she involuntarily strove to catch emilienne's eye but though she could not directly catch it for emilienne was looking full as jean she caught its gleam and she saw that the wife was upholding her husband applauding his protestation and renewing with him the promise of an absolute union in life in death in shame or in honor madame de monterey was jealous of the firm confidence emilienne had in her husband could she have exchanged the same look with gaston jean mortier resumed monsieur le notaire does me injustice when no doubt out of kindness to me he makes the supposition that i was disappointed enough about my uncle's will to have revenged myself upon my cousin i said to myself that it was partly my own fault that nothing had been left me 
i am not a man to speculate i am not a gambler who loses control of himself when he has lost his money as jean said this he looked full at the judge and as gabrielle sat behind the judge he looked at her too she lowered her eyes under his look i had grown accustomed continued the upholsterer for a long time past always indeed i may say to have bad luck it did not surprise me as much as you might suspect when i found myself disinherited i loved my wife all the more for it and my little girl i felt that i was more needed than ever to earn bread for them and when a man has such feelings in his heart he does not dishonor himself by poisoning the bread he is providing for his family monsieur le president he added turning to the judge there sits my wife she does not fear to come here because she knows that i am not afraid of anything that can be said of me before her you can question her she will tell you if ever i could have thought of giving her bread to eat that had been steeped in blood is this true emilien say jean spoke gently but proudly his voice was not loud but he raised it slightly and spoke with eagerness he had turned toward emilien she on his appeal seemed to feel as if she were marked with a glowing seal when she saw her husband's look turned on her she sprang up in her place yes it is true she cried with a clear steady voice those around her drew back respectfully the scene was pathetic but it impaired the solemnity of the courtroom the judge tapped softly on his desk and shaking his head commanded silence one of the bailiffs likewise came forward and by a hush that was polite almost persuasive bailiffs in the criminal court are as gentle as physicians with the incurable he requested madame jean mortier to be silent she obeyed there was a whisper in the crowd one could hardly have said of what nature it was partly one of hesitating sympathy partly one of curiosity and pity call the next witness said the judge jean mortier had sat down again and his counsel turning toward him appeared to exhort him to control his emotion and not to try the effect of any more such scenes upon the audience the great artist was probably afraid of weakening beforehand the peroration of his own speech the notary's chief clerk was heard after his master he went into a long account of the conversation between the cousins but he made no such comments as maitre Bosselot had done to satisfy the sense of justice the notary had seemed to have an eye to his future function as juge de paix if he should succeed in getting that appointment on giving up his present one for as it is the business of a juge de paix to do he appeared to be trying to reconcile justice with conciliation this was why probably he had tried to make accusation and defence fit into each other to the great prejudice of the man whom they most concerned after the chief clerk who told nothing new monsieur de monterey was called he came forward very properly very dignified and very pale with that pallor that seems the enamel of dignity as he began by declaring that he knew nothing absolutely nothing that he did not know the prisoner and never had seen him till that morning many persons present deemed his deposition hardly worth listening to and a good deal of whispered conversation went on comments on the last two witnesses like foam upon the waves the lawyer for the defence pushing his sleeves back and rising to his feet begged the witness to describe the looks and appearance of pierre mortier gaston who had begun well in a manner that was cold but fluent now appeared suddenly to hesitate he gave a pale smile as he looked up at the judge which seemed to say what's the use why need you ask disgusting details from a man like me but the presiding judge out of deference to the counsel for the defence insisted and desired him to give the court the details called for what well, monsieur de monterey had already said to gabrielle had committed to memory and knew perfectly by heart all of a sudden seemed to grow mixed up in his memory he stammered that he had not looked at pierre mortier attentively and that he was afraid he might make erroneous statements found on a rapid impression maitre lacal had to remind him of his previous depositions and by degrees brought him back to the statements that he had then expressed with great freedom concerning the bad ferocious defiant face of the murdered man then pushed to extremity like a coward who wants to make amends for his own fears by unbecoming rashness 
or like horses which run away after they have balked and have been admonished by the whip he flung himself into his part and said anything to the court that came into his head he swore to himself that he would save the prisoner no matter at what expense to the victim he therefore stood up boldly before judge and jury took the attitude of an orator and as he was not accustomed to public speaking kept passing his hat nervously from his right hand to his left accenting some of his words vehemently growing animated he was soon carried away by his subject and by turns was emphatic and trivial monsieur le president said he among other things it is true that that man the other man i mean did not impress me favorably oh no i did not pay great attention to what he was saying but i heard enough to make out that he was boasting insolently about a legacy and then he drank and drank it was a disgusting orgy i should not have been surprised if he had had a fit of apoplexy he might have killed himself by a fall but no it appears he did not i don't know of course what happened after supper i went downstairs with my friends i can only offer conjectures i am afraid it would be taking a liberty the bench is ready to hear you monsieur the judge's deference put an end to what little self-possession gaston had left oh you understand monsieur le president what i said to monsieur the juge d'instruction whom i used to know formerly he was one of my friends it was easier to talk about this matter in his office than it is here i am afraid i may take a liberty but never mind yes i did declare that the man that unfortunate man seemed to me to be a scoundrel if the word is too strong i take it back there can be no comparison between him and his cousin whom i see here for the first time but whose face is an excellent one i did say that no doubt that drunken wretch most probably had jostled had knocked against and insulted many men on the boulevard it is surprising he was not arrested and carried to the station how did he get as far as the bois de boulogne in that condition i cannot tell how did it happen he did not stumble and fall as he went along well if the prisoner really did follow him i am very sure he did not do so with any idea of striking him oh no no i feel that i know that i can swear he never did gaston was very much more moved than any one could have expected he passed his hand through his hair and rubbed it up from his forehead he twisted his fingers in it as if to get out the electricity and while all present not a little surprised at this sudden ardor on the part of a witness bent forward to listen to him he went on ah a man may soon turn into a murderer in certain cases the man who feels himself ruined for example on the eve of disgrace he probably hoped foolishly that the heir with his pocket stuffed with bank-notes would be moved by his condition would take pity on him would make him a present would lend him some money men have such fancies such insane hopes such superstitions i may call them at some terrible moments of their lives gamblers know that every man cleaned out de cave be it by speculation or by cards has such moments of weakness gabrielle who was listening with a beating heart in horrible anguish was afraid she might be growing deathly pale she lowered her veil over her face that club slang that gaston suddenly fell into alarmed gabrielle the wretched man seemed to her not making a deposition but a confession my god my god she thought is he growing intoxicated with his own words how far will it lead him there had been smiles even on the bench at the terms employed by gaston but no one was scandalized it seemed very natural that a man of fashion who was not in the habit of appearing before the public and who was intimidated by the solemnity of a courtroom should use his habitual language it was not considered disrespectful on the contrary it was a sort of proof of his sincerity it has been often said that men of great genius are much indebted to neophytes for breaking through the rules that govern them majestic regularly constituted public bodies judges especially have a sort of collective wisdom in the light of which they complacently dwell the court rather enjoyed this erratic way of speaking these unwanted club reminiscences and looked on them as vouchers for the witness's sincerity the presiding judge who was celebrated for playing a good game of whist smiled and nodded his head as if to agree with him 
gaston more excited than ever by this apparent approval started off again drawing himself up with renewed self-satisfaction and sharpening his voice monsieur le president allow me to describe the scene as i imagine it to have taken place in the bois de boulogne the man may have come up to pierre mortier darkness gives courage he may have asked a favor of him just alone at first he may have been refused roughly the deceased may have insulted the man who asked help from him who may have spoken with tears of his honor of his wife of his child who may have said he was about to kill himself he may have laughed at his despair yes that laugh may have been enough to turn a man who was desperate into a murderer as the man laid his hands on him tried to take him by the arm he may have pushed him from him he may have given him one of those blows with his big fist that might have felled an ox drunkenness had not weakened him then stung by the outrage by the roughness of the refusal anger may have been stronger than anything else in the mind of the man who had asked help he may have seen nothing around him and half blind and in self-defence he may have struck with one sweep of his arm the man before him with the handle of his cane gaston stopped short as if choked by a sudden spasm a murmur ran through the courtroom ah if he had but seen gabrielle as pale as death with closed eyes that she dared not open trying to blind her heart to keep herself from seeing you forget monsieur de monterey said the presiding judge or you may not know that it has been proved that pierre mortier was killed by a steel hammer and not by a cane the judge said this in a repressive way he was beginning to think that the deposition of this witness was getting tiresome and that this man of fashion was presuming on the indulgence shown to him true stammered gaston very true i did not know that is i was supposing your imagination is getting the better of you you can go down the counsel for jean mortier rose immediately i thank monsieur de monterey he said eagerly for having thrown light on a matter which has been debated by the surgeons who examined the body it is proved that the wounds to be so severe must have been made by some weapon that had a long flexible handle a nail can be knocked into a board by a little hammer like the one before us but to fracture a skull i defy the stoutest man the spectators laughed at this argument which impressed them maitre lacal said the judge this is discursive you must reserve these points for your defence excuse me monsieur le president we cannot begin a discussion too early and the testimony of monsieur de monterey has an importance concerning which i ask the court's permission to say a few words the judge deferred to this polite request he leaned back in his great high-backed chair gaston would gladly have done as he had been told and have sat down but he felt as if he could not bend his legs he was afraid he could not walk straight afraid that he might stagger in going back to his place he looked at the judge in a way that would have brought suspicion on him if any one had doubted the infallibility of the opinion he had already formed upon the case or had not been quite persuaded that a stupefying effect might be produced by the grave majesty of the assembly maitre lacal had a good deal to say concerning the last words that had fallen from gaston he commented upon them he amplified them he pointed out that they were the involuntary expression of a logical train of reasoning he implored the jury to take a special note of them and sketched out with great skills the points on which the trial must eventually turn according to him it was perfectly evident that to sustain the charge of a murder committed on a man of pierre mortier's physical strength it must necessarily be conceded and admitted that an adversary so delicate as jean mortier must have had some weapon that gave swing enough to strike a murderous blow here the counsel made use of a bit of biblical learning which had quite an effect upon his audience david could never have overthrown goliath by a blow of his fist he needed the sling and the stone now could the prosecution bring any proof that the hammer had been attached to such a species of wand why not said the imperial prosecutor in a parenthesis the whole scene passed in a wood maitre lacal gave a formidable and contemptuous laugh not at all respectful toward the imperial official but a public officer is fair game 
any sarcasm directed at him is permissible the counsel for the defense continued and appealed a second time to the very ingenious suppositions of monsieur de monterey gaston made a great effort to make a sound that might not rattle in his throat of course of course he said i expressed what i felt therefore you consider monsieur that the charge that a murder was committed by a little short-handled hammer is absurd this speech appeared to rouse the imperial prosecutor he moved in his chair gaston stammered yes it seems to me so and yet if the experts if the magistrates all this had lasted long enough the presiding judge wanted to put a stop to it maitre lacal he said you are taking advantage of the good feeling of the witness and his evident desire to give testimony in favor of the prisoner gaston started the judge thought he had offended him oh monsieur de monterey he said i am very far from disapproving of your feelings of humanity and all you have said even the suppositious case as you have put it has brought out some points that may be very useful in the inquiry and are not surprising in a man of your education you received a most unfavorable impression of the man murdered and your opinion of the prisoner is in his favor true monsieur le president i should like to save him this was said eagerly so be it but i must desire the gentlemen of the jury to remember that all you say is not fact but impressions you saw nothing of the scene you have described nothing consequently you have no facts to go upon but the gentlemen of the jury will take into account moral probabilities they will appreciate have you anything more to tell us gaston was afraid he had not said enough but yet he murmured nothing monsieur le president and a moment later he added without knowing how he came to speak i believe i am certain that the prisoner is innocent yes you said so before i repeat it monsieur le president he is innocent he is innocent gaston's tone as he repeated this was that of a man drunk or mad the judge renewed his proposition to monsieur de monterey to sit down and gaston satisfied with having been able to relieve his conscience twice by a solemn declaration in favor of jean mortier bowed to the bench and stiffly with his features working but apparently under the influence of the deepest pity went back to the witness's bench as he sat down he caught emilienne's eyes fixed on him questioning him with more curiosity than gratitude who was this woman looking at him so keenly why did her looks trouble his very soul if she were the wife of the prisoner why didn't she thank him by a smile instead of almost menacing him by the way she looked at him he felt ill at ease as he turned from this unexpected judge as to gabrielle when gaston saw her sitting with her head down and her veil over her face he dreaded to see her lift it he did not want to catch her eye he was not at all sure that she would smile upon him for the way in which he had fulfilled the task that they had agreed upon between them the other witnesses summoned by jean mortier told of the debts of the married pair and of their being paid the moment they had received the two thousand francs no one could accuse jean mortier of violence or ill-temper the cure owned that he did not often see him at church but his wife was there regularly and her husband's toleration for her pious practices proved clearly that he was not a bad man as he was not a hardened freethinker it was the less likely that he was an assassin the butcher their good neighbor burst into tears in speaking of the family his great ready face gave a sort of comic effect to his sympathy and though people did not laugh at him they smiled at what ought to have excited their pity he mentioned twice not to praise himself or to advertise his shop but as proof of the pity and esteem he felt for the family that he had offered them bouillon it seemed to him proof of a certain kind the deposition of the medical experts brought up a discussion on the question whether the little steel hammer could have struck with force enough without more swing than jean mortier's arm could give it short handle to inflict such blows naturally the two experts who both stood high as men of science contradicted each other the one owned his surprise at the view that had been taken of the case and demonstrated by dynamics and the science of projectiles that the scene as it had been represented was impossible 
the other on the contrary declared that nothing could have been more easy a slight blow on the temple would have been sufficient to stun pierre mortier drunk as he was and might have brought on a sudden congestion which would have put him at the mercy of a very much weaker man than himself most probably stunned by the unexpected blow the victim had fallen backward in his hair and at the back of his neck dirt and grass had been found the other wounds which had been fatal might have been made as he lay helpless unable to defend himself for passion tenfold increases the strength of a murderer excited by his deed of blood far from being surprised at the fracture of the skull this ingenious expert was only amazed that the whole head had not been knocked to pieces he cited a propos to his theory with exquisite art and in select language frightful examples of the same thing he affirmed that in crimes of this nature the murderer generally tries to disfigure the victim especially when the crime has been committed upon impulse in a sudden frenzy the alarm of the murderer before the fall of his victim leads him he asserted by an instinct of prudence into mad ferocity so that he would gladly annihilate the corpse that still seems to threaten him this fearful ferocity was in itself an indication of the naturally mild disposition of the murderer a professional homicide a man of homicidal character would have had more command over himself and would have scorned useless and aggravating mutilation what had been said of the prisoner's character he thought entirely consistent with scientific presumptions without wishing to influence the jury but solely absorbed in the scientific question the doctor on his soul and conscience thought the murder easy and probable jean he thought probably had not intended to strike a fatal blow carried away by his own suffering he had given his first stroke and then in the passion of despair which followed he had gone on the deed seeming irreparable but his natural good feeling having returned quickly he had paused with half his work of destruction accomplished and had rushed away the doctor started the idea that counsel might plead the irresponsibility of the prisoner resulting from temporary insanity as his learning captivated the ladies present interested the court and fixed the attention of the jurors he spoke at some length and made the most of his illustrations he cited popovon who walking in the fit of melancholy in the bois de vincennes had been turned into a murderer by a clap of thunder these two very different crimes each however committed in a wood that was dear to parisians made a coincidence or rather an analogy which was calculated to captivate the imagination what pendants would not two pictures of these dark deeds have made the doctor greatly regretted that he had not had pierre mortier's skull to strengthen by physiological demonstration his physiological and philosophical argument but in default of it he pointed out on his own head where the wounds had been made by the murderer the first blow had been given on the temple the mark was faint but clear this blow had brought on congestion the second blow had broken the skin the third had fractured the bone and the brain had oozed out with his fingers which ran over his head as if he were playing on a piano the expert executed a most skilful scientific demonstration he was young and the other doctor was old was it not natural that the one who had black hair should know more than the one whose hair was gray what would be the use of scientific investigations if the younger generation did not know more than the older one formerly what men of science learned led them to doubt nowadays certainty is the first condition of knowledge doctors are not called upon to consult over a dead body to express astonishment at death but to declare its cause this young and illustrious doctor was never daunted by a thing's being unlikely he was stimulated by it and reduced it as he would have done a sprain or a fracture to absolute truth jean listened stupefied he felt utterly overwhelmed what was it not enough that appearances so monstrous should be against him must this man who had no cause for personal spite who covered over his most cruel affirmations with protestations of kind feeling crush him in his turn and make clear to the eyes of others this dark abominable mystery when he was asked if he had anything to say he had no voice no eager words at his command to utter any protestation 
he only sobbed no he replied what can i answer i am not a man of learning i know but one thing and that is that i did not kill pierre that i never struck him and that i am innocent i swear it i swear poor fellow they believed him though they did not the less believe in the crime was it not possible that his memory had grown confused that he had forgotten the madness of a few brief moments maitre lacal was infinitely careful how he contradicted the young surgeon he reserved his attack till he should make his speech when he need fear no answer he did not wish to force him to bring out any more erudition it seemed to him as if the old doctor in spite of professional jealousy needed only a little pressing to come over to the opinion of his colleague old men not liking to be left behind very often modernize themselves as it were at one jump and yield to fashionable reasoning on the other hand juries when an affair is obscure lean greatly upon experts and in that way quiet their consciences these men who in their own line no more than the judges impose even on them the practiced lawyer did not want the learned doctor to be drawn out any further the speech of the imperial prosecutor was severe but he did not seem implacable while he called for a verdict of guilty he did not seem indisposed to admit extenuating circumstances he was a handsome man a literary man who is believed to be making visits with a view to his election to a vacant chair in the academy footnote in france a candidate for any vacancy in the french academy the highest honor attainable by a literary man is expected to call in person and solicit the vote of each of the remaining thirty-nine members translator end of footnote when he was not in the courtroom he had written a work on the folly of loving money which pleased the ladies and had married with great prudence a young lady with a large fortune he made in his speech which he had composed to serve as a new preface to his book in case of its going into a second edition some touching lamentations over that covetousness which corrupts the noblest natures and he pointed to jean mortier as an example of how men are led astray by love of money as to the facts themselves no doubt seemed possible whether the hammer had had a long handle added to it or whether pierre mortier had been struck by it in the way described by the surgeon who had been called in as an expert or not there it was the authentic indisputable instrument that had committed the murder and in the face of the confessions of the prisoner though he persisted in denying his guilt there was no possibility of establishing an alibi when the counsel for the defense arose there was a sigh of satisfaction from everybody the pathetic part of the drama was going to begin maitre lacal was superb as he always was he drew tears by his picture of the home of the good upholsterer as to the explanation of the murder he would oppose the opinion of dr tampmu to the pedantic demonstrations of dr tampi he touched with persuasive subtlety on all the changes all the probabilities alleged by the prosecution and after two hours earnest struggle with the ghost of the accusation he suddenly came to an unexpected conclusion veiling his purpose under a cloud of phrases he made an appeal to the mercy of the jury he implored the jurors to be humane and generous and if they doubted to give the prisoner the benefit of the doubt it was difficult for those who heard him not to believe that he himself doubted his client's innocence they could see that he had conscientiously fulfilled his task of advocate though he would not risk his professional honor by affirming that the man whom he defended was innocent i have already said that some lawyers high in their profession dread above all things to be thought to be their clients dupes they are like some actors who all through their parts seem to want the public to understand that they are playing a role and are not the real personage jean and his wife had listened with equal attention at certain moments when the rhetoric of the lawyer pressed closely on the arguments of the prosecution and seemed to overthrow them they had exchanged a look or rather their looks melted together as it were and something shone in their eyes like a smile but when toward the close maitre lacal seemed to be laying out his lines to gain all he could if he could not gain acquittal the two poor creatures gazed at one another in terror Emilienne looked round the courtroom 
which seemed to tremble and rock beneath her feet to find something that might save her on the edge of the abyss she fixed her eyes desperately on the crucifix that was placed over the chair of the presiding judge and implored the saviour in his mercy to set aside the verdict that these unanimous appeals to mercy seemed now to make sure gabrielle had raised her veil and lifted her head during the lawyer's speech she too grew very pale when she seized the meaning of the concession that maitre lecas was making and by a gesture that she could not have restrained she clasped her hands and raised them in a mute prayer trying with a feeling of touching union or else of sudden fear to be seen by emilienne and to seem to say to her bear me witness before god that it is not my fault if they find him guilty i am praying for him like you i dread the verdict even as you do but emilienne saw nothing but that divine saviour who had been unjustly condemned to death the judge before he began to sum up asked the prisoner if he had anything to say jean rose straightened himself and in a strange voice unlike the tones in which he had spoken before said yes monsieur le president i have something to say and that is that i wish to have nothing to do with extenuating circumstances i had rather die at once than to be sent to the galleys i implore you gentlemen of the jury put me to death if you do not think me worthy to be the husband of my wife the father of my child a sob exhausted his courage he fell back on his bench and tears streamed from his eyes the judge's summing up was considered by all the papers of the day a model of impartiality but the impartiality of such documents makes them the more dreadful in certain cases by reproducing with the like fidelity the arguments of the prosecution and those of the defense and by placing them magisterially in either scale the judge complicated things apparently for the jury and extinguished any remains of favor that might have remained in their minds from the oratorical electricity of the defense the jury took a long time to deliberate it seldom takes long to agree upon a verdict of acquittal and therefore while the court was waiting for the verdict the talk in the courtroom grew unfavorable to the prisoner at the end of a quarter of an hour people began not only to believe that he would be condemned to hard labor for life but they passed beyond the galleys and talked of the guillotine on this subject which excited a delicious terror in some imaginations conversation became animated the chances of pardon were calculated the delay that must elapse before the execution and some people who frequented the early morning exhibitions on the pleu de la roquette gave graphic details of former executions emilienne listened to it all her ears caught the dreadful words people near her lowered their voices a little but she heard them through the hum and the pale christ over the seat of judgment smitten afresh by the dreadful talk around him seemed to her to sweat drops of blood in his oaken frame she had remained leaning on the balustrade her elbows resting on the wood silent motionless savage and embittered thinking how she could visit her anger on all mankind and on the law itself if the blow she apprehended should fall on her innocent husband the platform now quitted by the judges left full in her view madame de monterey and now the two wives looked at each other gabrielle knew nothing of what was being said around emilienne but she observed upon her face the reflection of each horrible word she saw her petrified by a horror that froze all her limbs and she herself quivered with anxiety gaston nailed as it were upon his seat for he had not dared to leave the court-room was biting his nails furiously he looked every minute or two at his watch or cast suspicious glances to right and left of him as if he were afraid that somebody would feel astonished at his keeping his seat now that he had no part in the trial but carefully avoiding looking straight before him in the direction of the platform a judge sat there for him and him alone and that judge was gabrielle he thought the courtroom suffocating drops stood upon his forehead he did not wipe them off so that he might have been said to weep at every pore at the end of three-quarters of an hour the ringing of a bell made everybody start gaston folded his arms gabrielle clasped her hands tighter and emilienne clutched more firmly the balustrade the jurors came back 
they did not look so very terrible none of them were pale that at least was a good sign the foreman of the jury held with dignity before his breast a large sheet of paper on which the verdict was written if the paper had been blood-stained surely so good a man a worker in bronze he was in the marais could not have pressed it as he was doing to his heart the judges came in all these details which i have not invented and which form part of the everyday proceedings in a law court seemed to me indispensable to the atmosphere of the drama there was a deep silence a silence as if everything held its breath and the presiding judge requested the foreman of the jury to read the verdict jean who had been brought in at the same time as the judges entered stood up with his eyes fixed on his wife and pale as death the foreman of the jury placed his hand upon his heart which seemed to have an escutcheon or placard over it for the pocket-book in his pocket made a square outline on the left side of his coat and in an official voice he read on my honor and my conscience before god and before men the verdict of the jury is yes the majority decides that the prisoner is guilty as a murmur rose the artisan in bronze who was not of bronze himself hastened to add the majority of us consider that there are extenuating circumstances in favor of the prisoner jean fell back in his seat utterly overcome emilienne had been about to utter a cry but she restrained herself with all her strength what was the use of giving those spectators who had come there to look on grief the pleasure of seeing her despair she wanted all her courage now more than ever all was not over yet she would soon know how far human iniquity could carry the injustice of men many sighs had been uttered in that courtroom nervous people forgot the minor interests of the drama in the denouement and were very glad that it was not to have a bloody termination maitre lacal received the verdict with some compunction but he gave several of his colleagues a look that said plainly i expected it the imperial prosecutor demanded sentence the presiding judge then asked the prisoner's counsel if he had anything more to say i recommend jean mortier to the indulgence of the court said the lawyer gathering up his papers and in the commonplace tone in which a priest accustomed to death-beds says a requiem over a dead body as he is about to go away the judges had no need to retire to their chamber to consult together they rose drew somewhat apart and talked in whispers the chief judge like the officiating priest when he says the confession in the beginning of the mass bowed right and left to those around him and they like the lesser clergy in the service bent toward him and bowed to him after that jean mortier's affair was ended the judge went back to his place put on his cap the cap adds to his infallibility and after reading the articles of the code sufficiently abridged for the purpose gave sentence condemning jean mortier to fifteen years hard labor at the galleys this was not a severe sentence for so great a crime prisoner you have three days left to make your appeal for a new trial to the cour de cachasson said the chief judge mildly jean remained standing not stupefied but thunderstruck and trying to care nothing for the thunderbolt he remembered the words of the verdict it had hit him like an arrow in his face and imitating unconsciously the formula of the foreman of the jury he laid his hand upon his heart and said loudly on my honor and on my conscience before god and before men i swear that i am innocent i refuse any extenuating circumstances i refuse to appeal i refuse the galleys i commit my cause to god who will judge you all and will some day make manifest the real murderer when it's too late some newspapers blamed this speech saying it was too theatrical not to be the utterance of a hypocrite jean turned toward his wife farewell my emilienne that possessive pronoun uttered at that moment when wife and child and property and all things else ceased to be his appeared also a bravado jean quickly left the courtroom dragged out by the gendarmes not hearing or not listening to his wife who cried after him au revoir au revoir the crowd heard her and were differently impressed by this supreme protest 
people stood aside to let emilienne pass she had come there alone and alone she went away all her limbs trembled but she did not faint and without supporting herself by the wall she went down the staircase of the cour d'assises and hastened with a quick step toward the conciergerie she alone had understood the scene she alone had understood jean's wild despair she was no longer afraid of men's injustice she dreaded her husband's agony when she heard his appeal to god madame de monterey trembled as much as did madame mortier but she concealed it by bowing to the ladies who had sat on each side of her and who rose to go at the same time her face seemed only to express compassion but in her heart there was an indescribable dread in vain had she reassured herself by reasons of all kinds by ever so many infallible proofs in vain she had just heard the veritable authentic murderer tried and sentenced by the verdict of twelve jurors approved by four judges and believed to be guilty by a surgeon of great authority in vain her conjugal and maternal instincts said to her why are you afraid what the court has decreed cannot be undone the inquiry the labors of the juge d'instruction and the trial are all over there will never be any reopening of this melancholy affair something fatal was it superstition or a voice divine whispered in her heart it will be reopened it is not yet done with gaston is not acquitted it is he who will have to endure fifteen years at the galleys it was absurd but it was a madness that would not pass away monsieur and madame de monterey returned home separately when they next saw each other an embarrassment that they tried to put aside but which paralyzed all attempts at intercourse held them aloof from each other neither liked to be the first to speak of the trial however in the end it was gabrielle who began by pitying jean mortier gaston encouraged owned that he had trembled lest the sentence should have been more severe he thought the upholsterer would do well not to ask for a new trial then suddenly by a sort of tacit understanding husband and wife gave up this subject of conversation there was a long silence can we not leave now asked gaston a quarter of an hour later i was thinking of it replied gabrielle well why not go to-morrow to-morrow if you like we are ready then i will go and say good-bye at the club to everybody and so it was that that evening after dinner gaston went out and did not come home till very late in the night about the same time that he used to come home before his reformation gabrielle was lying awake but she was not watching for him shut up in her own room borne down by a burden she dare not examine too closely she had passed all evening and part of the night in tears gaston on the other hand had been very gay at the club too gay he had boasted of his deposition in the court-room and after midnight though he had not touched a card worn out by his own talkativeness which had given him a great appetite he had gone to supper with his friends as in the good old times of his games of baccarat he was completely drunk when he came home which was why he slept profoundly so that gabrielle who heard him snoring through the door was able to comfort herself by thinking if she pleased that he slept the sleep of the innocent End of chapter sixteen recording by diana beauvais chapter seventeen of the steel hammer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by diana beauvais the steel hammer by louis albach translated by elizabeth warmly latimer chapter seventeen another verdict monsieur and madame de monterey had been settled three weeks in the hotel de la metropole at geneva and every day they talked of continuing their journey but after their one great effort of quitting france to get rid of the anxieties that agitated them both they seemed to have taken a disgust to the project of a life of excursions and perpetual ascensions they dreaded to own even to themselves that they still needed something to occupy their minds and to draw away their thoughts from dwelling upon one subject 
to seek a cure is to acknowledge an evil and every day gaston would say to gabrielle we are very comfortable here let us stay but in reality both suffered greatly in geneva gabrielle took long walks with roger and went out boating on the lake the child was amused by that which only lulled the sorrows of his mother monsieur de monterey never walked beyond the town but he was forever walking within its limits forever on foot with no object apparently in view a day very seldom passed without his meeting somebody he knew from paris who was sauntering as if upon the boulevards these meetings gave him an excuse for luncheons or for dinners then the travellers went on their way and gaston who dared not be left to his own thoughts would stroll about the quays smoking his cigar watching for the arrival of fresh parisians making the most of any acquaintance however slight that had its origin in paris and turning it into a sudden intimacy of twenty-four or forty-eight hours duration which began when they met and ended when they said good-bye to each other though he was affable to excess with these intimates and very careful in his behaviour toward his wife and even toward his little boy as if he had been afraid that should he offend them he might rouse some suspicion of a restlessness he could not explain he was capricious proud and insolent toward the servants at the hotel and the general public he had two quarrels one after the other succeeding breakfasts where too much wine had been drunk the one at the hotel de burgress with a member of his own club who had not cared in foreign parts to be treated as an intimate by a man with whom his intercourse in paris had been one of mere formal politeness and who received too coldly as gaston fancied a hearty thump upon the back the other was on the quay with a man who was passing a genevese who had thrown away his cigar just at the moment when gaston was about to ask him for a light the first quarrel came near ending in a duel but the men gaston asked to be his seconds who had sat near him at the table de hout put him off by declaring that his extreme sensitiveness and the sharpness of his replies were due to a bottle of rhenish wine drunk for a bet after a more than sufficient quantity of champagne gaston who had grown savage at the idea of going out to fight a duel and who for a whole day had been making and remaking a vow to kill his antagonist was pleased upon the whole not to be tempted to commit a murder the second affair was more simple and even more ridiculous gaston had tried to break his cane over the man with whom he had picked a quarrel on the quay who however had seized the cane by a quick movement snapped it in two and flung the pieces into the lake then bowing stiffly to monsieur de monterey he said to him if you would like another cane i sell them my address is a la Cane de jean jacquet rue de montblanc where i am at your service the boatmen and the strollers on the quay had witnessed this scene which had greatly amused them gaston out of countenance dared not run after the man who sold canes and strike him with his fists he stood looking into the distance wherein the blue transparent lake floated his broken stick and remembered involuntarily the one that he had himself thrown into the fire at home he stood pale and trembling with shame anger and vexation monsieur le comte said a young democrat of the swiss confederation i'll go after it for half a franc if you like gaston roused by this offer made a gesture of disdain and with his hands in his pockets walked back to his hotel in a fury it so happened that that very morning gabrielle had remarked him switching the air with his light cane as he set out for his walk she met him when he came back with the same question she had put to him in paris what have you done with your cane lost it he did not dare to say as he had said before that he had forgotten it lost it oh how it fell into the lake ah the answer seemed singular and the fact a mystery gabrielle in her turn thought of the old ordeals by fire and water she was assailed by a presentiment which the discovery of the real story of this cane which she had heard some people discussing at the table de hout did not remove the poor woman fancied it an omen she had remarked that gaston was very pale and had a little foam at the corners of his mouth 
she went out as soon as she could and took a longer walk than usual with roger one morning gaston rode out early on horseback to visit voltaire's country seat at ferney perhaps he felt himself in a philosophic humor the house of the great master of mockery might give him a lesson at geneva every one talked incessantly of jean jacques and rousseau the patron of insolent vendors of walking-sticks was not at all to monsieur de monterey's fancy voltaire's brilliant wit always caustic and gay seemed to him a strengthening antidote gabrielle did not make many inquiries as to the rides and walks of her husband only when he did not tell her he would be absent she always waited for him before going to luncheon she was uneasy at his taking his meals without her and she felt no appetite when she was afraid he had accepted an invitation elsewhere she stood before the great door of the hotel with her son at her side looking out over the lake not that she fancied she saw gaston in one of those boats that every minute were coming up and being moored beside the quay but she was gazing into the distance with a vague feeling that she needed the soothing influences of the scene around the blue water was like a sort of sky brought down within reach of her eyes which were weary of looking up into the blue of heaven she had been there about half an hour when the postman who was going his rounds and who wanted to pass into the hotel brushed so near her that she had to move a little to avoid him is there any letter for me she asked without much curiosity for she really expected no news from france monsieur henrion having written to her a few days before what name if you please answered the postman gabrielle gave her name the man looked through his bundle made up beforehand for the guests at the metropole here is something for monsieur de monterey give it me the postman did not like to refuse to give a wife what was directed to her husband and gabrielle really had no great feeling of curiosity she took the envelope held out to her it was a very large one covered with postmarks and addresses and it seemed a good deal dilapidated by its long journey the outside of the letter looked strange to madame de monterey she tried to make out the postmarks and started when she suddenly perceived distinctly the postmark of Pondicherry. it was a letter from monsieur henri d'herbois a letter all the way from india what was there surprising in the fact that a traveller who had started for the land of the golden fleece should write to an old associate probably the envelope contained only news of his voyage descriptions of the countries he had passed through or had spent a few days in information concerning his inheritance or maybe commissions of more than one kind given by this man who had led a fast parisian life and was now exiled to the land of the banderas to a friend whom he believed to be in paris still never had madame de monterey been curious to read letters directed to her husband and this one written by an old associate at the gaming table an accomplice in all his follies might contain details confidences and reminiscences of a kind that might wound her modesty and convict her of indiscretion therefore her first impulse was with some disdain to slip the letter into the pocket of her dress but she did not take her hand off of it and in her pocket she went on crumpling it and feeling it there was a sort of electricity emanating from the paper which seemed to affect her fingers and impel her to draw them from their hiding-place but when she took them from her pocket they still held the letter and madame de monterey began again to read over the address questioning it as it were as if the writing could have told her what secrets lay under the seal this henri d'arbois if he had stayed in france might just as likely as gaston de monterey perhaps more so have been called as one of the witnesses on the trial had he not been one of the guests at supper on that fatal night perhaps at Pondicherry he had read the newspaper account of the affair perhaps he might say what he thought of the verdict or something about his friend gaston's testimony perhaps he had told his correspondent what he himself could have testified perhaps he might doubt the poor upholsterer's guilt and give good reasons for it which would throw light into her agitated heart poor woman i will make gaston let me read it she thought to herself but gaston no doubt had remained absorbed at ferney before the portraits of voltaire's chimney-sweep and washerwoman the hour of luncheon had passed some time before 
i am hungry said roger gabrielle took her boy into the dining-room of the hotel and seated him at table under charge of his governess who would not sit down without her pupil and then stung by irritating curiosity by a sudden savage hunger after certainty she went up to her own rooms rushed into her bedchamber locked herself in and tore open the envelope alas for gaston at that moment why had he not come back he deserved this infringement of his rights besides gabrielle was not conscious of any precise reasoning she wanted to know the first thing gabrielle saw in the envelope were two banknotes for one thousand francs each stuck into a letter that looked long what was the meaning of this before she read the letter madame de monterey turned the notes over and over it seemed to her she recognized them that they had something more than an ordinary likeness and uniformity with certain banknotes she had committed to the flames what purchase did monsieur d'arbois want his friend to make or what debt did he want paid why he had not sent him a check upon his banker why did he run the risk without taking apparently any particular precaution of sending two thousand franc notes in a letter on so long a journey during which they might well have been lost or stolen gabrielle would gladly have had the notes disclose to her what was in the letter and make it needless she should read it but the more she looked at them the more she examined them the more they seemed to make her a mute appeal the blue of the engraving on the notes was as blue as those mysterious waters that she had been looking at a few minutes before she felt impelled to read the letter she had to push her indiscretion or her curiosity to the very end if the letter were innocent gabrielle would make the most heartfelt apologies to her husband if the letter told the young wife scandalous secrets she would excuse herself to her own conscience by her desire to do right and so heal the outrage to her modesty but she must read it she would read it and she read my dear friend wrote henri de arbois are you still down on your luck if so i send you a lucky penny no it is not as you may think a little crumb a chip from my inheritance up to this time the inheritance has been unavailable in the lump it is like a block of diamonds i shall have to chip away at it for some time before i can carry it off in my pocket what i send you is but a restitution did you want to put my honesty to the test or were you trying like the steward in the bible story to slip your cup into my sack that you might have the satisfaction of having me brought back to the club by the rural police when i left paris france and europe with letters of credit on the bankers i was likely to come across during my journey i flung into a travelling bag without opening it the charming envelope in which your modesty had placed those fifteen thousand francs i had so boldly won and that you paid so promptly i assure you mon cher i never dreamed of counting them after you i was wrong and my politeness came very near making me appear a thief soon after i landed while arranging my papers of all colors and kinds i found yours i had been vowing during the voyage by the eternally venerable memory of my uncle the nabob that henceforward i was going to be a man of business an irreproachable financier i felt it due to the millions that had come into my hands i walk about with my eyes down trying to pick up all the pins i find and sticking them into the sleeves of my coat especially as a pin in these parts is more than probably surmounted by a diamond so it happened that my first cash operation has proved to me mathematically what i was always sure of theoretically viz that you are a careless reckless prodigal instead of the fifteen thousand francs i had been reproaching myself with having one of you i found seventeen thousand in your envelope i send you back the overplus at once i feel a sort of horror of this money if i were to keep it a week i might use it in speculation and i should feel obliged to pay you interest on it if i won i send the same notes back that i received out of respect to the truth and the superstitions of the gaming table i dare say it is very imprudent but i thought i had better take the risk some kinds of risks being favorable to gamblers it is the very last risk i will ever have anything to do with 
if these two notes should reach you accept them as infallible talismans stake them but be very careful not to lose them two thousand francs retour de la linde as they put on wine bottles what claret can be compared to them to put a gambler on his metal these two notes will bring you more luck than two thousand francs worth of the rope that has hanged a criminal i don't know but that on the whole you had better have them framed like a religious picture or an ex voto and not taint them at the club for i suspect they had a pious origin it may have chanced that madame de monterey seeing you come home looking so forlorn broached to as sailors say after that stormy night we all passed at the club and at the cabaret may have tried to buy your soul back from perdition by putting her hand into the cash-box where she keeps money for charity i have guessed right have i not the story you told me about winning largely in some low place between two and six o'clock in the morning was a little fib made up to save your conjugal reputation when you first told it me i did not believe it and now i believe it less than ever in what club or gambling hell would they have let you at that hour cut in at bakra if you had had any money of course they would have been glad to have you for the chance of getting it but to draw aside and let a fellow in who was cleaned out de cas and wanted to recover his luck you were too eager to tell me this story which i did not ask for and which you told very incoherently it had a perceptible flavor of being untrue the bravado of a gamester was put on to hide the submission of a husband you had begged your wife's pardon as i recommended you to do and you did the best thing she gave you money without counting it you took it without looking at it i received it thinking it was all right and so for several months i have been guilty without intending it of withholding this money from madame de monterey's poor ah my poor friend you were too irritable too feverish too savage that night to have been able to recover your self-possession and play a winning game didn't i think for one moment you were going to cut my throat with a dessert knife and unless you waylaid and robbed that clown who was gobbling away at the next table and who probably went off with the young ladies i cannot imagine how you could have made such a raise after being cleaned out so entirely apropos i wonder what became of that brute beast with his snout in the truffles flourishing that impudent pocket-book before our very eyes i will not bore you by any account of my voyage as to the boyaderas if you want my opinion of them here gabrielle paused it had been all she could do to get thus far in the letter a shudder and a cold chill ran over her and a rush of blood to her head made her nearly crazy the truth the truth as she had half seen it half touched it denied it shunned it fled from it now wildly seized her in its grasp it had pulled off its mask it was never again to be denied or hid how could she have believed that ridiculous story that gaston had been winning in some gambling house monsieur de arbois who knew all about such things had not like her been the dupe of such a fiction it was clear to her now gaston could never have had sufficient command over himself that night to play cards with any chance of winning his fellow gambler his second his accomplice had not been deceived he had detected those miserable falsehoods he had gone so far as to say unless gaston has robbed that countryman gabrielle rose up from the armchair into which she had dropped and looked at the banknotes with horror ah if you could but speak she cried and why should they not speak she would put them on trial she had kept the list of the numbers put down by the notary suppose two of them were engraved on these two bits of paper but even if they were not it was no proof the numbers written down might be on some of those notes that had remained at pondcherry and gaston's very mistake was of itself witness against him would any gambler especially one rather covetous of gain just after a great loss and in presence of a debt of honor not have known the exact amount of the sum he had won and would he have committed this blunder without finding it out no gaston in his madness after committing his crime had been in haste to get rid of the stolen notes taken from the dead man's body and he had given them away by the handful without carefully counting them that was it that was it 
all was now explained gabrielle tossed over her drawers and pulled out the little memorandum book in which she had written down the numbers and when she opened it she made no prayer to god that she might not find what she sought she suffered so much she had so ungovernable so agonizing a need to know the truth and the whole truth that she hoped on the contrary to find what she was looking for and she did find it one of the notes returned had one of the numbers put down by maitre Beausolot. gabrielle felt the floor rock under her feet and abandoning herself to her weakness like a wretch falling over the edge of an abyss she fell back thunder smitten and fainted away her fainting fit lasted a quarter of an hour her soul which did not take flight while her body lay like death did in spite of weakness persist still in watching over in taking thought for in resolving to save gaston all that is certain is that gabrielle on coming back to life came at that same moment back to her sorrow when she went into her chamber she had taken the precaution to bolt the doors she was alone free to think free to decide and she did decide what would she do first of all her conscience was on one point at rest there was no more debate possible no more subterfuges gaston was a robber and a murderer she recalled the hideous picture that her husband had presented before the court and instinctively she clasped her hands and asked god's pardon for him as she saw the awful vision gaston had been a murderer twice over he had let another man be sentenced in his stead his apparent generosity at the trial was only one phase of his meanness that crime at least must be repaired if it were reparable jean had been sent off to the galleys unless indeed he had signed his appeal and the court were still keeping his fate in suspense the first thing to be done was to interpose between the final decree of the cour de cassachon and the man who had been convicted in the cour de Cis. i say to the honour of gabrielle or rather not to praise her which would be superfluous but that we may see in it another proof of her loyal and heroic character that the feeling that she must save the man who was innocent if it were yet possible was as strong within her heart as her conviction her clear horrible conviction of the guilt of her husband yes she must save him that poor man so noble under the weight of injustice that was her most imperious her most pressing duty and to save him must she give up gaston she had the courage to ask herself this question could she ought she to dishonor publicly roger's father she never thought of herself or of the honor of her name nor of the sufferings to which she devoted herself she accepted public disgrace as an expiation she would go and live near gasto near him at the galleys and she would help his weak nature to bear its punishment she would take her share of it since all of this might not have happened had she watched over him as she ought to have done but must roger be the victim of her deed of reparation in order to save one human being who was innocent must she sacrifice another and that other fear joined itself to this doubt without knowing without inquiring whether she still loved the man whose infamy she had detected gabrielle said to herself that a jury would show no pity in his case there would be no extenuating circumstances the scaffold brutal and bloody would be gaston's doom was it for her to drag her husband to the guillotine must she become a murderess to avenge a murder all these ideas passed confusedly through her mind they swarmed and fluttered in her brain they came in like a flood they overthrew everything they probed her soul to the quick they obliged her to provide for all emergencies to improvise all kinds of resolutions at once first of all she must put the banknote that proved everything in safety to let it be destroyed would be the height of meanness if she did she would be making herself an accomplice in the crime she must hide the knowledge of the indian letter from gaston would any one be likely to inform him that the postman had delivered such a letter roger she thought had paid no attention to it and its arrival was not known to the servants at the hotel her purpose of obtaining from monsieur de monterey a confession of humbling him under the light that had come from afar and of bringing him to true repentance must be deferred 
at the first shock he might be capable of an act of violence or madness if fear came to him before repentance gabrielle wished to be free to find out some way of acting efficaciously before entering on the dreadful subject with her husband poor fellow poor fellow how could she ever show him this proof how could she tell him that she knew his crime knew all his baseness and his falsehoods she would think about that but they must leave at once and go back to paris there she could get advice from monsieur henrion he was a true friend one to whom she could tell everything a confessor but why not seek out a real confessor why not go to a priest to him whom she had already employed and commissioned to visit madame jean mortier the secrecy of confession is a guarantee of concealment she had heard of priests who had made men make anonymous restitutions a priest might carry to the council to the judges the notes from india he might say that a tortured conscience had given them into his hands and that the man condemned and sentenced was innocent he might say it but would they believe him could the law be satisfied with such a message would what she knew to be a proof be proof to the judges jean mortier had he been guilty might have paid away or flung away these notes at random unless she gave up the real murderer she felt that it would be impossible to convince the judges in vain gabrielle struggled to get out of the circle that hemmed her in she could not find an outlet she must choose between the truth which would lead to her husband's disgrace and possibly to his death and latent complicity was her duty so imperative as it appeared to be could there be no way in which she might drink the cup in secret she and she alone making it the one object of her life and dying of it in the end without destroying her husband and her son after looking into her conscience and her sense of justice gabrielle bethought her of her love the fight that was to be fought out must be a struggle between all possible feelings no one aggravating circumstance must be wanting did she love could she still love a man who had degraded himself at her side under her own eye under the outflow of her tenderness madame de monterey had never acknowledged up to that moment that a heart may give up an affection that bruises and wounds it love is a faith that unworthiness may offend but never can destroy at least so she had often said to herself in bitter moments of her married life the time had now come when the question had presented itself for immediate necessary decision could any feeling but that of resignation enable her to bear the burden of the marriage tie without esteem and confidence she remembered her early promise she recalled her young illusions she thought of that love born of the sisterly relation and the maternal tie that bound her to gaston she remembered the vow she had made to old monsieur de monterey had she not sworn to watch over him and to take upon herself the responsibility of his honor and his happiness was it not her fault that his honor was now sullied and his happiness lost had she been faithful to her task when she became a mother had she not sacrificed her husband to her son or rather her grown-up infant to her nursing one if she had done better she might have kept gaston at home she might have inspired him with the love the worship the habits the customs of the home she should never have let him expose himself to temptation to the excitements of clubs gambling tables and the society of reckless men of fashion like mothers by the couch of a sick child who blame themselves for their child's illness she thought that the incurable malady of gaston was her fault she kept saying to herself am i not to blame for his becoming a criminal should i not be more just if i punish myself only and let him go unbetrayed and this pity which spoke thus in her was love yes esteem has nothing to do with it a mother loves her son though he is guilty a woman cannot root out from her heart the attachment that arises from her sense of a man's need of protection yes she loved him still and she would always love him she owed it to herself to love him more since it was now her mission to redeem him what a work lay before her if she would extricate him and herself from the abyss in which they were now involved but she must not begin by giving him up that would be pushing him deeper in 
gabrielle knew that she had good courage but she also felt that she must have infinite prudence the difficulty of knowing when and how to act first added to her scruples if she must undertake to expiate or to repair the crime where should she begin she was thinking thus when somebody knocked at her door after vainly trying to open it it was gaston don't you want any luncheon he asked gaily gabrielle shuddered and then came a sort of savage instinct of compassion she had an impulse to get up rush to the door draw gaston into her chamber fling as it were his crimes into his face bow him to the earth humiliate him bind him over to repentance she wiped away her tears passed her hand over her forehead and as she walked slowly toward the door with tottering steps she smoothed her dress put the letter and the two banknotes deeper down into her pocket and then when she was close to the door she answered him are you sick asked gaston surprised by a trembling in his wife's voice i have not been very well responded gabrielle with a sad smile but i am better open the door to me open the door she opened it seldom had monsieur de monterey been in such high spirits he had come home in full health from his ride he drew gabrielle close to him he looked full in her eyes as he seldom dared to do and questioned her without her questioning him true you are pale we had better send for a doctor geneva has a horrid climate i was told so before we came we can leave it to-morrow i can't let you be ill do you hear what would become of me if i were anxious about you there was a genuine tender solicitude in these commonplace words and this selfish expression of interest men always adore the judge who never judges them and in a confused way gaston was conscious that gabrielle never would deal severely with him madame de monterey bowed her head and took her husband's arm though she kept firm hold of the two banknotes with which she could have struck him as with a thunderbolt and went down with him into the dining-room the amiable attentions and the gallantry of gaston were continued he told her all about his visit to the chateau de ferny made fun of what he had seen there and laughed at the impressions of other tourists more blasé than himself he said he was now sorry he had been so long making himself acquainted with the environs of geneva he meant to do better and through all his chatter he stopped several times to make inquiries about gabrielle's health he must be out of his senses he could not be wicked enough not to feel remorse thought his poor wife in her secret soul how can he be sure that he has escaped all danger even in this world roger who usually had very little direct conversation with his father that morning made him a smart reply and the laughter of child and father mingled in one peal while madame de monterey said in her heart the innocence of roger may surely be set against his father's unconsciousness of guilt since the father has no remorse why should i do what will bring remorse some day upon the son and as she left the dining-room she made up her mind to put her perplexities into the hand of providence and to trust to god to point out some way in which justice might be drawn from the cruel injustice of men heaven will help the right easier than men can help heaven end of chapter seventeen recording by deanna beauvais Chapter 18 of the Steel Hammer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deanna Beauvais. The Steel Hammer by Louis Albach. Translated by Elizabeth Warmly Latimer. Chapter 18 Another Court of Appeal gabrielle's hesitation how to begin to act was based at bottom more on the difficulty of choosing how she should begin her work of expiation than any pleadings of motherly or wifely feelings in all the prayers she offered up during the remainder of that unhappy day she cried o oh god i ask but one thing show me the way in which i should walk and i will follow it to the end she was answered more speedily than she could have expected that afternoon as she was restlessly going and coming bearing about her misery through the hotel corridors having sent roger out to walk with his governess 
and having let her husband go out without a word not being able to settle to any employment for books and worsted work would have been horrible in this frame of mind she walked into the reading room of the metropole sat mechanically down at a table drew toward her the first newspaper within her reach and resolved to read it through from the beginning commencing with the leading article on politics though she neither understood nor tried to understand what it was all about nor knew even if the paper were published in paris geneva or london having read the first column forming each word with her lips she went on meaning to read it all through even the advertisements on the second page her eyes as if attracted by a lodestone fell on a little paragraph where the name of jean mortier seemed to glow along the lines as if it had been printed in phosphorus she felt as if a serpent had stung her bosom and put her hand to her breast rubbing her eyes to keep her eyelids from twitching nervously as she read the drama of the bois de boulogne has just had its epilogue the murderer of pierre mortier who as our readers know had declined to appeal and who it was thought was resigned to his fate hung himself yesterday in his cell he was to have left paris the next morning the paper went on to give a few details of the manner in which the suicide was accomplished it made use of the occasion to criticize the want of proper precautions in the management of prisons gabrielle read the article three times over that she might get it well into her head into her heart into her veins then her cold hands let the paper fall she looked straight before her as if in the distance she could see that other corpse of a man slain by her own husband and was comparing it with that of the body she had seen at the morgue she saw them side by side as it were stretched out on the same table jean mortier was more dreadful to look at than even pierre he had no fracture in his head no steel hammer and no cane had killed him but gabrielle fancied she could see the white hands of her husband clasping themselves around jean mortier's throat even tighter and tighter until the mild intelligent face of that unhappy man swelled out of shape it was too horrible she caught her breath she seemed to be strangling too her sigh awoke an old gentleman sitting opposite to her who was dozing over a number of the revue des mondes thinking himself the cause of this sigh of astonishment and that the lady was scandalized by his nap the devotee of the review stammered an excuse and said politely permit me madame to ask you for that paper when you have done with it gabrielle's first impulse was to draw it out of his reach this stranger might chance upon the very paragraph she had been reading he might understand it he might guess her secret then suddenly she pushed the paper from her the old gentleman spread it over his breast just as the foreman of the jury had held his paper madame de monterey rose stiffly but firmly she was resolved that she would not faint and walked slowly out of the reading room she walked up the stairs with her hand on the baluster not to steady herself so that she might not fall but to strike it as she mounted every stair as a protest to herself that she had and that she would have all necessary energy when in her own room she went and stood before the glass and looked at herself earnestly henceforward i must learn to deceive henceforward no one must guess my thoughts could anybody suspect from my looks that i am the wife of a murderer during the morning she had exhausted all tender emotions now their source was dry i must enter on my work she said half aloud the paper makes a mistake there has been as yet no epilogue to the drama i shall furnish one the idea of a double suicide came into her mind as she thought of jean mortier's for one moment it presented itself like a sudden temptation but it found no resting place in her mind it seemed an attractive thought to die and to take gaston with her before the judgment seat of him whose judgment is final to offer in expiation two deaths more but self-murder can cure no ills she and gaston were not even innocent the guilty must live and expiate their crimes besides there was roger who had claims upon his parents life and honour yes i will live and he must live said gabrielle to herself firmly when she thought of forcing gaston to make expiation she would not allow her mind to dwell upon his crime she dreaded to be hindered in her plans by her own sorrow those whom she tried to think about were roger jean mortier's widow and his little girl gabrielle had made up her mind to place the decision of her fate in emilienne's hands 
to do exactly as the upholsterer's wife had done to her to go and see her and to say to her you can kill us disgrace us and avenge yourselves what price can i pay you that will ransom our honor all i ask of you is to spare my son truly heroic natures grow calm on the verge of a precipice there came into gabrielle's heart a strange feeling of rest of peace that was indestructible she sat waiting for her husband and when he came in from his stroll she was surprised to find that her whole nature did not rise up against him and that no burning tide of fever ran through all her veins he said to her with affectionate interest he had assumed since morning you are better now are you not yes my suffering this morning has passed away so much the better shall we resume our journey to-morrow we will leave to-morrow but we must go back to paris so soon i want to be in paris she said this in a tone of authority gaston could not refrain from saying what for gabrielle gazed at her husband trying not to put too much severity into the look she fixed on him she only wanted to see by his face if he had read the paper and if his morning's gaiety were or were not caused by an increased sense of security now that he knew the man who was not guilty was dead as she looked at him she crumbled the banknote and monsieur de arbois's letter in her pocket i have a duty that i must fulfil she said gravely a duty in which i want you to combine with me there was a slight shade over gaston's eyes but he said nothing he was on his guard after a pause gabrielle said jean mortier's wife is a widow monsieur de monterey did not seem at all astonished at this announcement he had heard it therefore already he asked no particulars is that the reason you want to go to paris he murmured yes for that only can't you write to her from here and send her whatever help you think necessary help what help can hinder that poor woman from grieving for her innocent husband when she has now no hope of proving him not guilty we owe more than that to this widow the words we owe were at once very bold and very threatening they almost betrayed gabrielle's conviction of her husband's guilt and yet gaston did not seem to be surprised at them he took them as a natural result of the marriage relation still he felt fear in his secret heart as his wife spoke to him he stammered what do you mean to do whatever madame jean mortier thinks best has she written to you asked gaston somewhat eagerly no she does not yet know that i know her husband was innocent gaston took care to ask no further questions gabrielle went on i shall do anything i can to share the sorrows of the widow and her fatherless child take care take care of what why i am afraid of nothing but my own conscience it tells me i am right in acting thus and i intend to listen to it gaston shivered so that he had great difficulty in hiding his emotion then said he in a sudden burst of resolution all i have to do is to make ready for our departure yes and to settle the hotel bill gabrielle was tempted to hold out to him the banknotes received that day from poncherry and see if he would use them but it was a mere impulse of irony she could not part with them she went back into her chamber gaston as he asked for his bill and watched the bookkeeper adding it up was thinking she still suspects me can she really know he passed his hand over his face and felt that it was moist with perspiration he looked at the moisture on his fingers with a shudder as if he fancied that they might be tinged with blood end of chapter eighteen end of the steel hammer by lewis albuck translated by elizabeth warmly latimer recording by deanna beauvais